Good evening, everyone, and welcome to Scott Valley City Hall. Um, we're going to have a, a special meeting first for about the successful agency of the Scotts Valley Redevelopment Agency. Uh, we'll open that, have some brief business, close that, and then we'll open up the regular meeting. So with that, um, I would like to call to order the meeting of the successful agency of the Scotts Valley Redevelopment Agency. That's what we've done it. Um, and a roll call, please. Chair Dillis? Here. Vice Chair Johnson? Here. Board Member Lind? Here. Board Member Reed? Here. Board Member Tim? Here. Thank you. Um, now is an opportunity for public comment time. I should point out that this would be, uh, you could make comments on things that are not on the agenda, but only items that are within the purview of this particular agency, which has to do with paying off the debts of the uh, previous redevelopment agency of Scotts Valley. So if anybody has comments about that, um, you're welcome to step forward and, and make those comments. Seeing none, we'll close public comment time. Um, are there any alterations to the consent agenda from council or city manager? Move approval. Second. Well, 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 well. Oh, successor agency only. Thank you. Um, just, I should ask the, the audience, does anyone uh, in the audience want to speak anything on the consent agenda of the, of the successor agency? Um, any other comments? Okay. With that, all in favor of the consent agenda, please say aye. 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 Opposed? The motion passes unanimously. And with that, we will close the meeting of the successor agency of the Scotts Valley Republicans. And we'll move on to the regular meeting of the City Council. I'll open that meeting. And uh, now we'll have a 
we'll have a Pledge of Allegiance, a moment of silence. And I would like you to keep in your hearts and prayers um, a person uh, named Kyle Werman, who I did not know him, but my, my sons knew him. He grew up in Scotts Valley, and he was a sheriff's correctional officer who had a medical emergency the other day and passed away, unfortunately. So please think of him as we uh, have a moment of silence. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. We have a special set matter. Oh, I'm sorry. Roll call, please. Thank you. Mayor Dillis? Here. Vice Mayor Johnson? Here. Councilmember Lynn? Here. Councilmember Reed? Here. Councilmember Tim? Here. Okay, now we have a special set matter. We have a presentation of Santa Cruz uh, Metropolitan Transit District annual report by Alex Clifford, the general manager. So, welcome. Members, thank you for this opportunity. I always enjoy my annual journey to provide you with the state of Metro. Uh, at the onset, I'd like to just uh, thank you for continuing to support and, and send uh, Donna Lynn to our board. Yeah, she's fantastic and a great supporter of transportation. And of course, over on the RTC side, uh, Randy always does a great job of supporting Metro. And anytime there's a question, he gives us a call and we try to provide him the information. So thank you for that support. So I'd like to just uh, start off as I usually do with a couple of quick updated stats. Our budget this year is 49 million. We have about 319 people employed at Metro. We own 100 fixed route buses, uh, both the fixed route and the commuter buses, the Highway 17 buses, and we run on 26 routes across the county. Uh, in addition to that, we run what we call the complimentary service, the paratransit service under our uh, uh, paracruise uh, name and we have 41 transit vehicles, paratransit vehicles there, of which we just got a bunch of new ones this year, so that was pretty exciting. Uh, our service population is the entire county, 264,000-ish, and we provide 5 million fixed route commuter, fixed route and commuter trips per year and another 72,000 on the paratransit service. Uh, interesting nugget that I always like to update, last year it was almost 50% of our ridership are the college students and the faculty from UCSC and Cabrillo. This year, I'm happy to announce it's a little over 50%. So it's actually growing as the population of the campus grows. So usually you are curious about how we're funded. How do we fund that $49 million? Where, well, about 19% of that is funded through the fares that come in the fare box. Another 46.5% of that is from the 1978 dedicated half cent sales tax. We have that dedicated to us in perpetuity. Thank you to the voters of this county for doing that for us. And then an additional thank you for Measure D because they provided us another 16% of Measure D. So all of that combined funds nearly half of our entire budget. Um, so when you talk about self-help, we are a self-help county. We are a self-help agency. Uh, about 13% is state operating funding sources. Uh, much of that is that new SB1 money. Thank you for that, uh, state legislators. And uh, thank you to the voters for not passing Prop 6 and, and uh, taking that away from us. That would have been devastating to you. It would have been devastating to us if we had lost SB1. Uh, continue on, a little over 8% is federal funding assistance that we receive. 11.1 uh, is what we call capital eligible money. That is some state STA, additional STA dollars and some uh, small transit intensive cities dollars, what we call stick dollars that come to us from the federal government. Um, we can use that in capital, we can use that in operating, so that's what we point that out. And then uh, just under 2% is leases and advertising and some other little revenues, and that's one of the areas we're focusing on, trying to grow. Every time you see a bus out there with no advertising on the side, it's a missed opportunity, and we just need to keep working on that. Uh, so out of all of that, <coughs> the board, um, now, for what will be the second year in a row, we'll be able to parcel out $3 million to put over on our capital side to help us 
leverage that $3 million to work on our capital needs, our sort of state of good repair. And I'll come back to that in a minute. Um, so, uh, kind of turning to uh, uh, Scotts Valley, um, as I reported last year, uh, we've been trying to sort of push out the tech buses from taking up all of our parking spaces at the transit center uh, and encouraging them to find space elsewhere. They probably should pay for space wherever they go. They are for-profit companies, and we are not a for-profit company, so they shouldn't be taking up the spaces that our riders need. I'm happy to report that we've had great success um, following some of the comments that you made last year. The tech companies reached out to me right away, actually, and um, uh, we, they've all moved out with the exception of one, and the one is trying to move out. They're working uh, to find another location, and uh, I'm, I, I'm sure when I'm here next year, they will have moved. We have great uh, conversations every two weeks, and I'm confident that they'll, they'll do that. In the meantime, we'll probably um, have them pay us for some spaces until they do leave. So we hope to have that resolved within the next uh, six months. And then additionally, as you know, we've had some issues, if you will, overnight parking predominantly with some of the folks in the Blue Bonnet uh, condominium track using the spaces and we've engaged them recently in some discussions about the possibility of leasing or licensing some spaces to them. Um, we don't want them to become long-term dependent on us because we hope through marketing efforts to be successful in growing the ridership on Highway 17. So we do want those 200 and some spaces to be all customers boarding buses going over the hill. But for now, we will have a little bit of excess capacity. Um, it could benefit them in the short run. It could benefit us in the short run. So it could be a win-win. So we're in discussions with them. Now, interestingly enough, if you've been to the transit center, and I'm sure you have, you notice that there's a beautiful building there that's been vacant forever. Uh, I think there has been a tenant there at some time that predates me. Uh, I am happy to report that we have signed a lease. Uh, so we do have a tenant that's going to start work on that facility February 1st. Um, they will sell manufactured nuts and biscotti. Uh, they they uh, may have a storefront there. I think they want to have a storefront there. We're hoping to have a storefront there, but minimally, um, they will have some employees there, and we'll parcel out some of those precious spaces for their employees. Um, also related to the transit center, um, you may have heard some rumblings this week about some tree removal, and I just I apologize for bringing that controversy to our community. Uh, and I apologize for not getting some word out ahead of you so that usually I would rather you hear from me first than the community. I didn't get that right and I apologize for that. Um, but the fact is we have a lot of trees in that facility that were just the wrong trees. And they grow with uh, very big shallow roots and they've been lifting up sidewalks and curbs throughout that project. And look, we're, our, our revenues that I described earlier are a precious resource and we need every penny we can to go into that transit service. Um, and it's not a good use of that money to be replacing curbs and, and driveway approaches and things like that. So we, we remove the trees and we'll work with our landscaper and we'll, we'll talk to your city folks about getting a recommendation of the right tree. Hopefully there is a right tree that won't, 10 years from now, also lift up sidewalks and curbs. But we'll work closely with the city to see if you have any ideas too. Um, so we won't jump to, jump to any conclusions, but we know we got to put something back there and we'll definitely follow through with that. In, in the bus service area, um, shortly after I was here last year in March, we had one of our service changes. I told you about some things that were coming and those did happen. Um, we had a really exciting change on the Highway 17. So we had a route that started off in the morning at 635 in Santa Cruz, come up the highway service the Scotts Valley Transit Center and then go over the hill. The problem with that is by the time I got to the Scotts Valley Transit Center, it was basically standing room only. So your residents, our customers originating on Scotts Valley, had to stand on the trip over the hill. So we made a neat little change there. That trip still leaves Santa Cruz, but it just heads straight over the hill. And we started a brand new route that starts out of the transit center at 6.50 a.m. So we're, we're, we're providing those customers a seat instead of a place in an aisle to stand. Uh, in addition to that, uh, Donna has talked often about um, the downside to the fiscal crisis we had a few years ago and the impact on service in your community, particularly on Scotts Valley Drive. Um, so that northbound direction, um, the only stops that were serviced were just a couple of stops that were Highway 17 stops as some of our routes go out down on Scotts Valley Drive up to Granite Creek and then onto the highway. All the other stops just didn't have any activity any longer. Well, we're happy to report that we've started that journey so shortly after we met last time. Uh, we took a 35 that runs uh, in the San Lorenzo Valley and brought it on through the transit center 
So it services the transit center at 3.57 p.m. and then it, moves, it goes on, um, it actually goes down Mount Herman, turns left on Scott Valley Drive, goes up to Granite Creek and gets on the highway and goes to Santa Cruz, arriving there at 4.20. So it's a little bit, it's just a start, but it tells you that we're sincere about trying to reestablish service on Scott Valley Drive. Um, you have all those beautiful bus turnouts there. We, we need to be providing service there. We need to pick up customers there. Um, you last time asked uh, a number of questions about the data related to boardings in Scott Valley, and I will tell you that um, uh, we've updated that. We estimate about 175,000 boardings and the lightings occur in Scott Valley annually. That's about 584 average daily trips. Highway uh, 17 commuter service has about 19,500 annual trips, or about 65 daily boardings and lightings here in Scotts Valley. And we're doing a survey later this year, so we can just kind of guesstimate on this one, but we guesstimate based on some, some data and analyzing some data, that we have about 46 lightings in which people are coming to your community, we think, to work in your community. So that's always uh, exciting, and it's a number we should continue to grow. It's not a big number, it's a good number, but we can make it better. Uh, in the way of things that are coming later this year, after we get a marketing director, we're going to put a full court press on a program to try to encourage people to get out of their cars. Uh, anybody watching us on TV today that's driving over that hill, probably doing so, maybe they were once customers for us, but they're probably doing so because gas prices are so darn cheap. We just need them to come on back. Um, we have a great service. We want them back and we want to grow that service. We're going to put a lot of effort into trying to do that and to try to fill those 200 and some spaces at the transit center. So hopefully next year when I'm standing here, I'll be able to tell you that we had a program and it was a success. Also later this year, we're going to initiate a pilot project, a mobile ticketing project on Highway 17. This is really exciting and new for us. It'll allow customers to, in effect, buy their ticket on their smartphone and then they'll just flash that media to the bus operator to get on and go. One of the things that we struggle with on Highway 17 uh, and it varies sometimes between bad and worse, is that we just can't get people boarded fast enough. And the longer it takes to get people boarded on that bus, the later they are when they get to the other side of the hill, particularly our students headed, sent, headed to San Jose State. We want to get them to class on time. We want to get people to work on time. Well, when we have customers feeding crumply dollar bills and pennies and change into the machine, it slows it down. So flash media, uh, on the smartphone is really going to help that. I look forward to reporting on that next year. And then, as I know, Don is as excited as I am about Avia Automatic Vehicle Location. Um, we are late to this game, but we will have the GPS. We, we got state money. Thank you, SB1. We got state money that helped us buy that. We bought it. We awarded the contract. It's being installed over the course of the next year. And by late this year, our customers will have a customer-facing application on their smartphone where they can look and see what time that bus is coming to the stop. No longer will they have to go stand at the stop and hope the bus comes on time. If it's running late, they'll see it on the smartphone, they can stay at work, they can stay in class, they can stay at home until the last minute and go out and catch that bus. So that's exciting, that's coming later this year. Uh, back to the buses, we're working hard to replace about 50% of our fleet that is way over its useful life. Um, we have great mechanics and they keep buses going. We have 1998s that are running great but they are old and it is time to replace them. And that's a big challenge. That's anywhere from 38 to $50 million in order to do that. If I buy compressed natural gas buses, that's 750,000 average on a bus. If I buy electric, fully electric buses, that's an average of about a million. So that's big, that's a big difference. And that's a big, big nut that we have to figure out a way to crack, and we will. Uh, to that end, uh, we got some money for some electric buses and we have some Proteras that we're wrapping up the order on. Those Proterra 100% electrics, four of those will arrive sometime early next year, and we'll do a big splash. We're doing the most difficult part right now. We've never operated electric buses, very few people have, and we have to figure out how to put together yard charging infrastructure uh, in our yard. We'd like to have that in place when the buses arrive, because when they arrive, we'd like to put them in service. So we're working hard on that. Uh, another three over-the-road coaches for Highway 17 that are intended to be zero emission, 100% electric buses. That's on hold. The only manufacturer uh, that produces those, we brought one out, it failed, it couldn't do the job. We know that there's at least two more manufacturers in the next two years coming into the market. As soon as they do, we'll test their buses if they work going over the mountain, if they can pull that mountain. 
and then we'll use that federal money and we'll go buy those three electric buses. Wouldn't that be cool to not only have our first over the road coaches, but electric over the road coaches. So we'll do a big splash when that happens too. And then as you probably saw, we kind of put our toe in the water with electrics through the hybrid, diesel hybrid electrics. Um, we did a deal with VTA, our partner on Highway 17 service. They, they transferred 10 of their diesel electric hybrids to us. This is a great way for our people to learn how to run electric buses um, for the, the huge price of $1 a piece. So we paid them a dollar, we paid them $10, we got 10 buses, they're 24 tanks, they have a lot of life left in them. We held a media event here and BTA C CEO Nuria Fernandez came over the hill um, and we did that on December 14th. We did that at the Scotts Valley Transit Center, that was really exciting. And then finally in closing, uh, as you're probably aware, the California Air Resources Board, or what we call CARB, recently adopted their new regulation, which will have uh, fleets across the state of California 100% electric, they say, by 2040. And uh, for us, what that means in the category we fall into is starting in 2026, we have to buy 25% of anything we buy as 100% zero emission electrics. And then starting in 2029 and forever, 100% of everything we buy electrics. Um, that wasn't, that didn't really give us a lot of heartburn because a year prior to this regulation, our board adopted a zero emissions program in which they planned to take us 100% electric by 2040. So um, we were already on that path and they just affirmed that for us. Um, Council members, Mayor, that concludes my presentation and I'm happy to answer any questions. Questions, comments? Vice Mayor Chuck? <clears throat> Thank you. Good report. Sounds like, um, in, in many ways, you have to face competition. Uh, people who are in their cars, like their cars, and to get them out, you have to do, provide the types of things that I think the forward-looking process that you're going through uh, might be able to deliver. Yes. Um, which is pretty exciting and pretty good for a government agency, too. <laughs> we try to be innovative. We try to give the customer what they want. We want to not only attract them, but we want to retain them. Appreciate that. And one thing I know has been asked, and I know you have working on an answer, is the enterprise building, that there's more interest with Santa is becoming more and more occupied to have um, service reestablish or a setup for that area to yeah. um, address those needs. Yeah, definitely still on our radar trying to figure out how to make that turn and make it work in the system. Right. I know it's I know it's in the planning. <clears throat> Often they asked about it, so that's my brief. Alex, thank you for that presentation. Uh, you left out the most important part about your presentation, though, and that's that you're a Scotts Valley resident. Yes, yes. <laughs> so I, had to, I had to note that for the record. Um, so again, very informative, just like it always is. Just in case, maybe for folks in the audience who are watching the TV who don't, uh, aren't um, as well versed in the nuances of public transit, when you talk about 19 cent fare box recovery, um, somebody who's maybe, again, not familiar with transit might hear that and be like, oh my gosh, that's woefully inefficient. But would you maybe just take a minute or two and, and kind of walk through why that's actually not too bad of a number? Yes, sure. So what that number means is what percentage, what percentage of the overall operating is, is retrieved through the customer putting the fare or the $2 in the fare box? Um, so I gave the 19%. Now, that number was just a little bit erroneous. It's actually, it's actually closer to about 23% because in that 19%, I used that capital. So technically, you would take the capital money out. Um, so we're, we're up over 20%. What it means is, is uh, when you're looking at funding, whether that be federal funding or state funding, they do, when they judge whether to give you a grant, one of the things they might look at is how efficient of an operation you're running. Um, we're not a for-profit operation. Uh, public transportation never is, um, but when we're up over 20% and approaching 23%, we're one of the better bus fare box recoveries in the state. Uh, a lot of other transit properties, you know, suffer in that sort of 15 or so percent. So, so we're doing pretty darn good, and um, we're going to keep trying and keep trying to do better. So thank you for the question. Now, thank you, and again, a wonderful report. Donna keeps us updated on a regular basis, what's going on and what we can do to help, but uh, I know I never hesitate to let her know, and we'll, uh, we'll be there for you. Appreciate it. Number 10. Yeah, thank you, Alex. I uh, also want to add uh, great work with the tech companies. I know that was a real issue for a lot of residents, and that was filling up the center there, so thank you for that and, and finding a solution being proactive on that. I think that's a really good thing. Looking forward to your next report. Uh, when that's 100% time, so thank you.
Thank you for your support. And, and again, because of the comments you made last year, it motivated them to come talk. So thank you for that. And I know we've talked about it, but there has been some um, interest or concern on social media as far as work being done on the overnight parking and, um, and the partnership that we have. And you may want to address that as well so that those watching will understand that. Uh, yeah, I appreciate that question. That, that there is a lot of misinformation out there about uh, what is going on and how it might impact the farmer's fair and, and uh, 4th of July uh, use of the parking lot. Uh, we're in a partnership with the city on that. Uh, we're not 100% owner of that property. And the neat thing about that partnership is when we need the, the, the intense parking, you don't. And, and when our customers come back and grab their car and go home, that's when you typically need it. And on weekends, we need very little of that parking. And so that works out great for the Farmers Fair and all the other events that happen throughout the year in that area. Um, there's nothing that we plan to do in any way to disrupt that wonderful partnership and that use and that complementary use of that facility. So anybody watching, please put that one to rest. That's just not going to happen. What, what is happening is we're going to start enforcing the overnight parking. Um, you know, we've had uh, problems with the, the Blue Bonnet folks predominantly using that parking. They shouldn't be using that parking. Um, we might, like I said, we might do a deal with them. Uh, but we've also had some problems with uh, some RVs recently, um, some abandoned vehicles. Uh, so we're going to enforce it. And, and what that means is probably about 2 in the morning, um, starting in February, a security guard will come by and post something on any vehicle that's there and give them their first warning. And then they'll get a second warning. And probably by the third one, if they still keep doing it, they'll get their self towed away. Now, we have some, now it's a transit center. And there are some legitimate overnight parking uses in a transit center, right? Envision one of our Scotts Valley residents um, going to take the Highway 17 over the hill to catch Amtrak to go off on a vacation for several days. We don't want to have them come home and find their car impounded, right? So we have to create a, a permit that those people can call us in advance and get so they can display it on their dashboard and prevent them from having that kind of adverse situation. Um, so we'll put a lot of thought into it. Hopefully we won't make any mistakes. We're trying hard not to. Uh, if we have to delay the enforcement another month or two just to get it right, we'll do that. Um, but we do, we do want to get a handle over who's parking there and why. And as you can imagine, when you're thinking about the Farmer's Fair and the Fourth of July and other things uh, related to that, they're probably not parking there at 2 in the morning. So I don't think there'll be a conflict. And Thank back, you. back when we were back when it was repaved, we found several cars from San Jose Valley that had been left there for weeks at a time and things like that. So, you know, as a community, we don't want that. We don't want people living in their cars there and and uh, and just uh, dumping these vehicles there. So it will be good for all of us, I think, to have that have a system. We want to be a good neighbor. Yeah. Thank you for all these great things you're telling us. About. Um, I have a couple questions. Well, first, biscotti. Did you say they're manufacturing biscotti, the yeah. Italian cookies? I'm told it's nuts and biscotti, yes. I love biscotti. I mean, I look forward to that. I'll be a regular customer, so I'm, hoping, I'm sure they'll be good. Um, also, I was wondering just a little bit about the trees. Do you know what kind of trees they were that were so disruptive? I, I should have gotten that answer today. I'm, I'm not a tree person. I don't know one from another, really, basically. But it, it's just our landscaper came in and, and helped us make a decision they had to go because they just grow these surface roots. The city had a similar issue uh, along that corridor there. Um, do you know if the intention is to replace with a like number of trees? Probably not one for one. We'll probably investigate what trees would be optimal and where to place those. Mm -hmm. um, we thought about maybe some dwarf uh, junipers might fit in a couple of locations there and some uh, low maintenance drought resistance kind of shrubbery kind of things. Uh, ultimately, at the end of the day, again, we'd rather put our dollars into the service on the street. So whatever we do there, hopefully over time, will increasingly cost us more money to maintain. Um, but I, I, you know, I'm happy to work very closely with the city staff to get their opinion on what we do there. Okay. Good. Um, I'm wondering about safety. I haven't heard of any issues about the safety in our buses, but I know if you look at other other areas in the Bay Area, there are places where uh, you know transportation is not that safe. Do we have any kind of a safety issue on our buses? You know, on and off again, it's not a frequent thing. Uh, by the way, I want to thank you for safety related to the Scotts Valley Transit Center. Thank you for having Scotts Valley PD go through there periodically. That really helps keep things the way we want it to be, so thank you for having them do that. 
uh, or thank you to them for just doing it, whatever it is, but it's helping us. Uh, on the bus, uh, you know, we're installing, we don't have 100% cameras on buses, but cameras on buses do help to deter crime, uh, especially when you have a screen there where you can see yourself on the screen. Um, so we're going to, over the course of the next couple of years, try to find money to finish that off. And then we have some, some folks that have created problems, safety issues on the bus, and we've gotten real aggressive in the last couple of years of taking them to court and getting temporary restraining orders. Um, we just had two individuals that had uh, been thrown off our system for over a year. We went to court this week and got a three-year extension on their TROs. They were just the kind of folks that were creating some real big problems for the customers. Um, so we will do what it takes to keep our customers safe. Well, just us. given the large number of passengers, it sounds like it's a small issue relative to how many people are very much is. Yeah, our, our customers are hardworking people. You know, live paycheck to paycheck. They just need to get to work and get home, and get to a doctor's appointment. Yeah, good people. Any other comments or questions from Council? Thank you very much, Alex. Thank you, and I'll see you again next year. Sounds good. Anyone in the public like to make any comments about uh, Metro? Seeing none, thank you. We'll move on to um, the city, the committee reports. We'll start on my left with Councilmember Reed. No reports, Mayor. Okay. Councilmember Tim. Um, I had the pleasure of attending the League of Cities conference mm -hmm. up in um, Sacramento this past week that was training for new council members. Uh, it was very informative. I want to thank uh, the staff for me uh, get to that trip. And, and uh, I saw Jenny up there. She was there. They had some actually really fascinating issues they went over um, and some that are maybe impactful for our city. And I got a chance to catch up with our city manager about that. Um, the state may try to uh, take away some of our impact fees. And we're, we're looking into what that may be and how that could impact our city. Um, but that's a new thing that the uh, potential uh, Newsom's new budget came out with that, that could be impactful to Scotts Valley. Um, we also talked about mutual aid that's available for wildfire prevention. Um, the city has allocated earmarks and dollars that are available to Scotts Valley and um, also available to uh, for the reduction of fuel. And so we talked about ways that we might be able to tap into that uh, and work with some other uh, interjurisdictional agencies that could help with, with uh, preventing wildfires and, and disasters that happen in our city. Um, another item they talked about was uh, we have coming down the pike here is statewide delivery of cannabis is uh, now allowed and so they can deliver within the Scotts Valley jurisdiction um, and uh, they suggested cities considering uh, cities that do not allow um, sales of marijuana within their jurisdiction you might look into how you might want to tax that as a local jurisdiction so that may be some low hanging fruit for us to address in our budgets. Um, they were also talking about drone delivery, uh, and we may need to find some laws uh, locally to deal with drones delivering within our jurisdiction, as that is something that is going to be allowed at the state level. Um, for other city council members, uh, social media was a big item for the Brown Act discussions that we had, uh, and uh, uh, they reminded us that even three of us liking a social media posts or replying to it together can create a Brown Act issue. So. Just something to be aware of as we're online. Um, <laughs> interesting? Yeah. So, um, uh, yeah, take note of that. I mean, you know, as an attorney, I found some of those discussions very interesting and concerning. So, uh, <laughs> careful what you do online. I think that's a general rule for everyone. Um, uh, also, uh, another item they talked about under housing was, and I don't know if we have this as a city, um, and I forgot to mention this to you, Jenny, but. Uh, we do have, uh, they recommended a city opting its own uh, CEQA guidelines that would be a reduction in the state guidelines, so you don't have to go through all the state regulations when you're going through a CEQA act. There's a lot that, that the state comes down with that they don't have applied to local jurisdictions. It might not make sense for Scotts Valley, so um, we might consider that. I know we're short-staffed and, and doing anything out of the ordinary. <laughs> uh, it's a big strain on resources, but that was something they recommended. So that was my takeaway. It was actually really good training, and, and um, uh, highly recommend anyone that, that we bring on, and including our some of the new uh, people we have joining our planning commission tonight. Uh, if you get a chance to attend one of these trainings, they're very helpful. Thank you, Council Member Lynn. 
Yes, I had um, a LAFCO meeting the first of the month, and we, uh, among other things, uh, approved uh, an annexation for Heritage Parks, which is Monte Fiori. I'm there uh, joining the Scotts Valley Water District, and uh, that's been a couple year uh, process to get, get through. Um, but it will be really helpful to them and, and uh, being able to address some of their needs. And had a bu metro budget meeting earlier this month and addressing the uh, standing of where we are and, and similar to what we're doing with the city as far as the, the, some of the challenges is the sales tax coming in late and some of the challenges with that is the same thing metro is dealing with and working with. And um, um, pension issues and other things are many of the same things that we're looking at. So it's interesting to be able to have that those numbers and figures and, and uh, share that information with Jenny and uh, just have that other, other component involved. Criminal Justice Executive Council, we um, had met and uh, planning a gang awareness prevention conference within the community, trying to find ways to, to um, reach our youth and find ways to get them in healthy activities and why, you know, understanding, helping parents and, and adults understand why kids are drawn to gangs and how we can provide resources that, um, that you know, keep them from looking to the wrong places for, for what for that companionship and and due to peer pressure. So that will probably be next fall. And we have the Santa Margarita, um, one of the first groundwater sustainability educational series and uh, Mayor Tillis and I attended on Saturday um, at Felton Community Center. There were about 100 people in attendance and really an excellent uh, uh, workshop really um, nice to see pretty much 50-50 participation in Santa Rosa Valley and Scotts Valley and that um, conference is available online if you go to the Scotts Valley Water District and look for the Santa Margarita Groundwater Sustainability, that, that information and, and uh, the conference is available online and we thank uh, Taylor Bateman for his participation and uh, really some good information provided and uh, helping to spell some of the um, concerns that there's the concerns from Santa Rosa Valley that the water issues are Scotts Valley's fault, and you know there's some Scotts Valley thinking well Santa Rosa Valley's not participating. So that dialogue, and by the you know starting at the beginning there was more um, misunderstanding, and it seemed to be as we got further into the conference far better um, cooperation and just really a, a, a nice change in the. the attitude of wanting to work together to resolve and address these issues. And there's, this was the first of three. We have a Santa Margarita meeting tomorrow night at 7, and a Metro meeting Friday morning at 9, so anyone's interested in any of those topics, that they can join us at uh, the uh, Santa, Santa Margarita room, Scotts Valley Water District, for that meeting tomorrow evening. Vice Mayor Johnson. Thank you, Mayor. So, the, I met with met on the RTC, Regional Transportation Commission. And about five years ago, the rail line was purchased. And there's been, a, obviously, a pretty big discussion in terms of how, what is the future of that rail line? How is it going to serve the, the county? And um, so, over the past oh, year and a half, there's been a consultant that has um, done a uh, unified corridor study that you know, gave the whole spectrum of uses on there, what would, what would be the best use, highest and best use, and so forth. Um, but uh, this last Thursday, the Regional Transportation Commission decided to study it just a little bit further uh, and really bring in a little bit more in terms of the economic and also the environmental impacts that, that uh, this corridor, any use on it would entail. And so, uh, you have train, another, uh, one of the things that was brought in was bus rapid transit, you know, having smaller buses. Uh, the man who just left knows an awful lot about both, all types of transportation. Uh, he used to, he used to uh, work on and be involved with the train systems and, and so forth. So that's going to be a further study because, it, because without the economic impact, without knowing how much things cost, you don't want to just jump in, you know. Um, Alex mentioned before that you know they're a nonprofit, and you can't treat transportation systems like a true business. Otherwise, there wouldn't be any. Okay, uh, 
you know, if it was a private business, they'd all go bankrupt and there'd be no uh, bus systems in, in the country because they don't turn profits. But at the same time, when you're starting off with a capital expenditure on something like a, a whole new train system, you kind of have to study that closely so you don't get trapped in the whole idea of just sinking more and more money into a system, uh, and in my mind, a, a train system that would be uh, very expensive, be very difficult and expensive to run, and also compete with Metro. Okay, you'd see, you'd see it would diminish the ridership of Metro. And another thing, since everybody else is kind of parochial on that uh, commission, you know, what's in it for the fifth district? What's in it for Scotts Valley? Okay, not too many people are going to use that corridor for our purposes as far as uh, transportation, especially during rush hour. Um, so that's going to be, a, I think, a, a good thing. That was unanimous, and you don't get a whole lot of unanimous votes. That was unanimously agreed upon to have a more vibrant uh, and closer study on, on that part of it. The other part was a little bit more contentious. Uh, there's a company called Progressive Rail. There's a short line operator that provides transportation, mostly freight. Uh, and most of the freight, uh, since Semex, most. I think most of you know where Semex was, it was up in Davenport. They closed a number of years ago, and since then, the demand for freight has been greatly diminished. So, the question is, do you want freight on that line? Uh, uh, do you want an excursion on that line? So, so uh, on a 6 to 5 vote, and I was on the losing end of that particular vote, um, they decided to approve a 10-year agreement with Progressive Rail to allow them to put put freight on the corridor, but right now most of the freight that ha that happens goes from Watsonville south. That's where the company is, that's where the concern is, uh, and legitimately so for these uh, companies who have produce and what have you to get their product to market. So, but our contention was is that, you know, from Watsonville south, that's perfect, okay, but there's not much that's going to happen north of Watsonville because, the, the you know, the terrible storms we had two years ago destroyed a good part of the, the <coughs> railroad tracks. Those railroad tracks are going to have to be replaced anyway, especially if passenger rail, quote, ever, ever happens. Um, and so, mm -hmm. we'll see. We'll see what happens there. Certainly nothing is going to happen in the, in the immediate future within the 6 to 12 months or eight, even 18 months because there's just so much that has to be done to kind of bring that, that rail line up to a serviceable uh, level. So uh, stay tuned. Um, but I think it's going to be interesting where we take a much harder look as to the economics of either bus rapid transit, um, we're going to, and to me, the bus rapid transit part of it, uh, that would be where you have an exclusive uh, lane, especially on Highway 1 as it gets widened. Sometimes during the commute, you might be able to have a bus instead of being stuck in traffic, would be at rapid transit and wouldn't have to stop and it would be like a diamond lane for buses and, and carpools. So um, that could be in the future. So pretty busy at the RTC. Thank you. Um, Councilman Lynn mentioned the Santa Margarita Groundwater Agency uh, Education Workshop and I did thoroughly enjoy that. I learned a few things. Uh, we heard that nationally there's less water being used, which I didn't realize. And a lot of that has to do with the fact um, they give examples of, you know, new washing machines use less water, and all these other things are happening in our lives that are driving us in, in the direction of using less water. So um, that was interesting to me that, um, that it's not just an issue right here, it's an issue everywhere, and the trend is, is encouraging. So I was um, happy to hear that. Uh, I attended the Seniors Advisory Council, which um, is, uh, uh, advises on uh, uh, some of the, the funding that comes into the county and programs for seniors uh, countywide. And we heard that um, some of the previous budget hiccups of the federal government uh, caused a lot of disruption in the funding coming to help senior programs. That's not true this time. Apparently the senior programs were protected in the budget so far and they're not part of the, the budget hiccup. Um, but one of the issues that is bubbling that could hit pretty soon if the federal um, uh, budget, uh, lack of passing part of the federal budget continues, is that there will be a, a food stamp issue. 
I guess apparently there's been an advancing of some food stamps, but that's going to run out in a few weeks, and so we may have folks that aren't able to get food stamps, which is a fairly sizable uh, number of people countywide. Um, so just wanted to, to share that with you. Um, and then yesterday I attended, uh, as, as an alternate, uh, another a different redevelopment oversight committee. We had a meeting earlier tonight about uh, our own approval in the process. Well, there's a series of steps to and approvals that have to happen in order for the city to be able to uh, pay off its old redevelopment debts. And so I participated in, in, a, in a, uh, a process of the county building, which interestingly, very unusual. They approved what we approved tonight, but the county approved it before we approved it. So that was kind of cool. They'd already approved it before we, we had discussed it. So, But it all worked out well, and, and um, we, of course, want to pay off our debts. Uh, including some money that's still owed to the city itself from the redevelopment agency, so we're monitoring that closely. And that's my report on committees. Yes, I had a question for uh, Council Member Eric Tim. So at at at, at that um, when you met, was there any discussion? Jack just brought up the uh, redevelopment. Was there any discussion about the future or? Uh, hybrid redevelopment coming forward with Newsom versus Brown was greatly opposed to it? You know, uh, they didn't get into whether or not we're going to see a new form of redevelopment coming forward. I mean, they were talking more about dollars we might lose through, like right now we have a different impact fees that we collect as a city and then that we, we don't use for four different projects. And so the risk right now is that money might leave us um, I did have a discussion um, kind of outside of uh, the league. I got a chance to sit down with Mark Stone, and we talked a little bit about uh, kind of some of the impacts on Scotts Valley and some of the legislation that was coming down. We talked about housing, we talked about a few other things. But my uh, takeaway from him was uh, their hope is uh, not only for schools, but some of the city funding. We might see something coming when the 2020 split roll tax initiative goes on the ballot, but that's going to be a very controversial <coughs> initiative. Uh, but at this point, uh, even though the state's flush with cash, um, they're kind of looking to, to hold on to that uh, for worse days to come. And um, I don't think that uh, uh, they didn't get into Newsom's budget having some special new redevelopment. If, uh, Mayor, if I could uh, just add to that, there are um, uh, there are several constituencies that are pushing for action on uh, some sort of a redevelopment 2.0 that would be geared towards funding affordable housing. Um, and in the previous session, that didn't make it through. I think it's fair to say largely because of opposition from the teachers and the nurses union. And so there's still concerns about whether those organizations are going to uh, potentially support that. I do know there are there's talk of if it's not able to get through the legislature this year, there would be an effort to bring something to the ballot in 2020 to recreate a, a 2.0 that would be specifically tied to affordable housing. So uh, it should be one of the many uh, interesting things we're going to see in this uh, upcoming session with this new governor. Good discussion. Um, We'll move on to the city manager's report. All right, well, thank you, Mayor, members of the council. Um, I'd like to uh, update the council as a part of the Kings Village sidewalk um, project. As you know, Alex had mentioned the challenge with trees, and one of the reasons um, I'm bringing this up is our trees were removed because of that fact, and we will be replacing those trees within the next couple of weeks. So you'll see those crepe modals, and we'll be uh, letting him know that those are actually very good trees to plant. Um, as a recommendation. The other thing I want to note is that we are going to do some finishing touches on uh, the driveway that was recently completed uh, that's next to the Goodwill where you pull in. There are some modifications that need to happen to that driveway. We received some feedback so we want to make those of note and any adjustments that we'll be making to those driveways will be completed by the end of February. Uh, the League of California C Cities, thank you, uh, Councilmember Tim. Um, I did attend the Policy Committee on Revenue and Taxation, and we did talk um, at length about the governor's budget. RDA was uh, brought up. Um, although we had the opportunity to hear from the finance uh, director from the state, and they were kind of trying to dodge that conversation, so it's very interesting um, to hear their respond to that. I was not optimistic, but I'm hoping to see something um, come to fruition. But they did talk about some of the improvements that um, Governor Newsom is proposing. Um, some of them include increasing the rainy day reserve, paying down their um, pension liabilities, 
increasing spending for K through 12 in higher education, which is a very good plus. Um, and then of course the emergency preparedness aspect as it relates to wildfires, which is really important. And then finally homeless shelters and then a moderate housing production were some of the key things that were highlighted. But then as uh, council member Tim said on a more um, kind of negative note, there are some issues that we have concerns with, with tying housing production to our transportation funds. Um, tying them to our impact fees, and so we are definitely going to be vocal uh, with the league about how we feel about that. So more to come. Uh, I'm sure you'll see some letter requests from the league come our way too, uh, position letters, uh, so we can share um, our perspective on that and how that will affect Scotts Valley in particular. Uh, we also talked about the implications of the Wayfair decision, and that's requiring remote online out-of-state retailers or vendors to collect and remit sales tax, which will be allocated to cities through the county pool. It was brought up as to whether there was a formula so that we could figure out what the fiscal impact would be to us. Uh, we were able to get a precise answer, but the best thing that I can leave you at this point, we will um, in time, but it's going to be at least a positive thing for our budget. And so we've seen over the past year our use tax increase, which is good due to Amazon, and we're going to see that continue to increase probably through the 1920 budget. Um, and then uh, further, so the 2019 Santa Cruz County Traveler's Guide is out. Visit Santa Cruz County publishes that, and it features Scotts Valley and our latest hotel, uh, Four Points Sheraton. So you can check that out on our Facebook page. We have that posted, and we'll have that um, online on our website as too. So we're really glad to see um, some more uh, Scotts Valley things highlighted, and I know we're going to have an opportunity to push that a little further as we talk about our policy committee appointments. Um, and then I'd like to give a shout out to the Scotts Valley Police Department. They were at the Santa Cruz Martin Luther um, King Jr. Day March in Santa Cruz. So really glad to see uh, Scotts Valley out there representing our community uh, for such an important day and event. And then finally, uh, Saturday was a community gala that's hosted by the Chamber. And I was really happy to see some of our council members in full costume in the 20s. So the mayor looked great. He was in a little pinstrip suit and a nice hat. And Donna, I know, was in full costume. So it was a great event. I have to tell you, if you haven't gone to that event, you should really check it out. More than 200 people were there, and it was happening. So really glad, and I was able to bring my two kids to see a lot of our community heroes um, acknowledged that day. And it was just a real treat. So congratulations to all those that received um, recognition and award. And that concludes my report. Thank you. Thank you. I'll now we'll move on to public comment time for anything that's not on the regular agenda. Please step forward. And there is a limit of three minutes for each speaker. Good evening, Wendy Brannon. Um, I have brought to the city's attention that Green Waste, our garbage provider, did not give the required two-week notice to residents on their cans for our unlimited waste pickup in November. And they've done this, I should say, our garbage service provider has done this many times in the past. And what that means is our residents can't take part in utilizing that service. And considering that we only did three, I believe, street sweepings last year, and we no longer have the blow and sweep and we have a high fire risk that we need all the help we can get with our reduced staff. So I'm encouraging um, staff to go back, read that, contact Green Waste, and get a free notice to pick up done. Um, I also, unfortunately, was, I guess, two days short. Um, I had called the city manager about my concerns about the driveways along um, Kings Village Drive. Um, all three of them are really seriously bad. It is an utter shame. Um, unfortunately, the width of them are not wide enough, and you can go by and see the curb, which is the one as you go up. Uh, in order to make the turn, you have to swing into oncoming traffic, and that's really dangerous. Uh, the driveway by Goodwill is even more problematic because we have um, a sidewalk there. So I'm really hoping that, one, that this is not going to cost us, and I'm hoping we can recoup some of the staff time that it's going to take to bring this to the attention of whoever is doing it. And I would also take notice that today when I tried to go up um, Kings Village Drive, the contractor was doing some work. 
and they were working along the corner, and it was barricaded about 10 feet down toward the highway. So I came through the signal, moved over to the lane, and all of a sudden there's four cars stacked up to go on King's Village, and the lane's closed. Um, our police department's busy enough, our public work staff is busy enough, and we just, we just can't do it. So um, we need to hold those contractors to the same standards of safety because it's the residents we're talking about. And moving forward, my, my wish for all of you as you enter your next terms and a, and a new year is to be really conscientious of how you make comments in public. Um, there's comments in the past about, you know, can't wait for this, and we're going to be sitting outside at the new brewery, and, and we're going to have homes at, um, you know, the old Santa's Village property. And there's a lot of hopes and wishes, but things don't get done, and I think it's appropriate to watch how we express our enthusiasm. Thank, Thank you. you. Hello there, my name is Rita Hewitt, I'm a program analyst with the Health Improvement Partnership and SafeRx, Santa Cruz County, which is co-housed right here in Scotts Valley. And we collaboratively work with the community um, prevention partners and we first want to thank um, Scotts Valley City Council for passing the Extended Producers Ordinance, also known as the EPR, which provides the community with disposal locations for medicine and sharps. Um, paid for by the pharmaceutical industry. And so now Santa Cruz County is considered a model for the state as we now have 52 local disposal sites and five of which are in Scotts Valley, so that's really exciting. And so recent data from the California Healthy Kids Survey shows that Santa Cruz County's youth perception of harm relating to prescription drugs is actually decreasing. So that concern is really alarming for us. And so it's important that we recognize that, and the primary way that youth have been accessing medication that is not prescribed to them is through homes, whether that be their, of their homes or other people that they're in their homes. And so to bring awareness to this critical issue and prevent youth and adults um, to accessing medications not prescribed to them, SafeRx and Community Prevention Partners are collaborating on a community-wide, county-wide educational project to engage our community members about safe storage and disposal of their medications as well as sharks. And we're doing this through a survey and supplemental materials, um, which is in your packet. And so this survey is completely anonymous. We have created content in English and Spanish. And people that will take the survey will receive information on medication storage, disposal, um, and receive um, all the disposal sites that you see in your packet, so that infographic will be in there as well, and links to in-depth information um, for resources if there's people they know that are seeking um, treatment. And so in order to get this best out to our community, we request that each council member sends out the flyer that is in your packet next Tuesday, January 29th. That's the launch of this survey. Um, to, their, to your constituents through email communication lists. Um, we also request the city um, post the flyer on their Facebook page. And lastly, we would be happy to um, come back and report to you after three weeks of the survey being open to um, tell you the results and our progress improving um, youth access to prescription drugs and the positive impacts <coughs> to reducing overdose deaths in our community. Thank you. I have one question. Um, is um, can, is there a, another way folks could take the survey? Is can they go online and, and take the survey? Yeah. So that link is that actual yes, that's, link. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And then we also have paper copies in case someone does not have that. We want to make sure we're reaching everyone. So um, I'm happy to give my contact and have paper copies printed or do outreach um, ourselves because we do want to capture everyone. Thank you. Any other comments, members? Yes. Um, if somebody's listening right now and wanted to find one of those five locations in Scotts Valley, is there a website they go to for a sharps disposal? Yes, if you go to hipscc.org, that's um, our organization, that last um, flyer, there's an infographic with all 52 locations and then the five of Scotts Valley. And that's HIP? HIPSCC.org. HIPSCC.org. Two Ps. Yeah. Both are pharmacies, though, with the medical clinic. Mm -hmm. 
places, mm -hmm. and the police department can do that too. Yeah. Great. Thank you. Thank you. And Thanks. one more thing, I just to add, I know I've, I've walked my neighborhood a lot, and um, in the last few weeks I've found two syringes, one not, not covered within 10 yards of the entrance to my court, right along the side of the road, and uh, brought it in and turned it, uh, you know, turned them in. But it, you know, we think in Scotts Valley that we're not concerned. We know the beaches and other areas, but here in Scotts Valley, it's a problem. If I can find it in the Granite Creek area, the syringes laying alongside the road, we need to be aware. Yeah, and that flyer outlines what um, pharmacies take back exactly what. Yeah, so thank you. Thank you. Anyone else to speak with us, to us about uh, public comment time? Thank you. We'll move on to the consent. We'll move on to the consent agenda. Are there any alterations to the consent agenda? I would like to make a comment uh, about item G, the uh, bicycle friendly community item. Is anyone from the audience want to speak to that topic at all? Okay. And why don't we pull item G, uh, and we'll make that the uh, first item on the regular agenda. Call that 1A. Any, any other comments? I'd, I'd just like to thank our appointments, our appointees who are here. I don't know that I need to pull it, but just want to thank uh, my appointment as, uh, as you know, Chuck Mafia, and here willing to serve on the Planning Commission. I know that there are others too, but... Uh, Thank you for the, your willingness to serve. Any other comments or items? Anybody else in the audience want to speak about any other topic on the item A? Item A. Okay, we'll pull item A as well. Which are the minutes of uh, December nineteenth? We'll make that item one B. And uh, item D. I also wanted to recognize Lori Gentile. Uh, who uh, were recommended to serve on our planning commission. She's done a fantastic job with Parks and Rex as their chair. Uh, excited to uh, hopefully have you added to our commission. And um, also want to thank Debbie Muth for her years of service. Uh, she would, I served alongside her for five years, and she's been doing that, I think, for 15 years as a planning commissioner, and she's done a great job. So great service to our community. I want to thank her for all her years of service. No, and I, I Robin, um, Donovan was my fun commissioner and good friend, and, and uh, she moved out of the area, so uh, my thanks to her as well for her years of service as well. Thank you. Well, can I have a motion to approve the consent agenda minus items A and G? So moved. Second. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion passes unanimously. So we'll move on first to item G, um, which is the bicycle funding community. And I just want to make a few comments, um, just that I'm very happy this is on here. Um, I give you, Scotts Valley already is a bicycle friendly community, and I would love to get the recognition um, um, that we are one and are moving in that direction. Um, and I certainly want to thank the Active Transportation Scotts Valley volunteers uh, for uh, spearheading the, the leadership and for staff, staff supporting this effort to, to bring it forward to us. Um, I see. Not only is it uh, a, a growing part of our community, we obviously have some, some employers here. Uh, so we have a bike shop, uh, Cycle Sport, Scotts, Scotts Valley Cycle Sport. We've got, um, uh, let's see, we've got fa uh, Fox Factory, and we have, um, let's see, we have another major employer here. I'm trying to remember what they're called. Uh, Bell Helmets, yes, it's part of Vista. Vista, thank you, Vista Recreation, yes. Um, and so we have, uh, and of course we have uh, the Glenwood Preserve. We now have a uh, mountain bike trail on the, on the west side. Uh, we have green bike boxes in town. Um, we have a lot of things happening, and I see that as part of our future, and I've heard other council members say this along the way, part of our future economic development. You know, if we can attract folks to visit our town and make ourselves a cycling center, uh, that's a good thing. Uh, it's healthy. It's, it's good for our, the vitality of our economy, and having us called a bicycle funding community would be a great thing. So those are my comments, but if you'd like to make some more, please step forward. Thanks very 
much, Mayor and City Council members. My name is Joe Fleming, and I've lived in Sky Park for over 14 years now. And um, two years ago, um, some of your citizens and myself, we started this active transportation group with the hopes that in our small little four square mile city that we'd start to see a lot more people walking, busing, biking, um, skating, scootering, you name it. But just that we'd have a lot more engagement with each other as citizens. Um, a walkable, bikeable city is a happier, more economically vibrant city. Um, folks are more likely to stop in at shops and spend money, which is a great thing. Um, so that was kind of our goal when we got started. And since we've got started, we've attracted resources and um, visibility and awareness for this issue. We've attracted about 1.5 million in funding for resources for this city, so it's been a great help with grants. Um, and we've got uh, Safe Routes to School, an active transportation plan in the works as a result. Um, so we're really doing a lot, and, and we want to be of service to your city council. Um, if we get this designation, we'll be joining our neighbors in Santa Cruz and Watsonville, um, which would be exciting. And um, we'll also let folks that are thinking about coming to our community how important this is to us. Um, so I think it'll be a good attractor. And I have some of my colleagues here that want to say a few words as well. Um, just, um, yeah, I want to add to that that um, it'd be great to get the support of the City Council because um, it's like a bronze, silver, gold designation. So I think, uh, you know, if we get a bronze, for example, it'll uh, motivate the residents to um, do more for, for biking in the, in the city. And um, I just think it would be a good uh, um, marketing kind of um, designation for the city. Um, to you know, help the economic development as well as um, having it be a nice place to live. Thanks. Hi, uh, Brad Kramer, uh, Scotts Valley resident. I uh, just also wanted to mention one of the things we've worked on with the Active Transportation Committee is a rolling school bus where uh, some adults in the community provided uh, some supervision um, kind of safe bicycling habits for children um, as a way to, to actively move to and from school. Uh, reduces congestion, gets kids active um, in a way that's hopefully healthy and safe. And uh, Scotts Valley Police have been really great about <coughs> chaperoning kind of the first one of the year and providing good motorcade, which is exciting for all the kids. So just thank you for the support in the community. Any other council comments? Vice Mayor Johnson. Yeah, I think that rolling, that rolling school bus uh, is great. I, I just wish for the last mile, or I guess maybe a quarter mile, going up Scotts Valley Drive towards Vine Hill, if somehow that was a protected bike lane for kids, um, that would be that would be uh, fantastic. As a matter of fact, in the the RTC, uh, when we voted to to explore more alternatives. Um, there was a promise there to expand the study on protected bike lanes throughout the county, which is uh, good, especially on places like uh, Soquel and some of the Water Street and some of the other ones where there's heavy, heavy use. Um, but you're right, the, the Safe Routes to Schools, the, the RTC and the city, our city uh, provided a lot of, um, I think that's a, a really nice way for people uh, uh, to, to get to the high school, it should be used a little bit more. But I see lots and lots of people there because I, I kind of ride my bike here. I don't know if it's legal to ride it through the parks, but I still do. Um, um, but that's that really opened up the ability for us to travel from Pine Hill School to the high school. So it's uh, it's great, especially for um, when you have things like softball events there and so forth. People and sometimes you have softball up at the high school. And then you have softball at Siltonen, and people use that uh, uh, a lot. And when we get our park done there, sometime in the next generation, um, it will be even more enhanced. So, uh, but thank you for all you do. Yes, Councilman Tim. Yeah, I'd like to add Joe and Martin and Brad. You guys have done a great job uh, attracting dollars for the city to help with this effort, and, and that's not gone unnoticed. Um, you're doing some really incredible things. Um, and I know with the Ed Foundation, uh, we worked for years to bring the Mountain Charlie Challenge here, and that was such a successful event. We had people coming from all over the area. We have one of the most beautiful areas to road ride, 
Now we've got some great mountain bike trails as well in town. Um, and uh, I really uh, commend you guys for the work you're doing. I hope you keep it up. Um, the rolling school bus has been a big success. The school district has really enjoyed what you're doing. And I think that's great for the kids to participate in. I want to echo uh, Councilmember Johnson's comments uh, about giving a protected lane uh, down nearby hill. I think that would be a great idea. And um, you know, just thank you again for all your efforts in, in bringing this to us. Um, and I rode one morning with the Royal School Bus, and I loved it, and I was so impressed with the, the parents the, and the, um, the folks that were volunteering their time, and it was a very safe, um, very safe procession, and the police certainly helped as well as an officer out there. I happened to go on a very, very cold morning, so there weren't a lot of students, but I understand normally there are a lot more students. But it was very well done, very safe, so I would encourage any um, students or parents listening to, to involve yourself because it's, it's a great experience to, and it's healthy. And it's a good, uh, it's a good example for our youth. So thank you very much. Let's see. So with that, is there a motion to approve item G on the consent agenda? I'll move to approve. Second. All those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion passed unanimously and now we'll move back to uh, what was item A on the consent agenda was now item 1B, which are the minutes of the City Council from December 19th. Ms. Brandon. Your agenda on December 19th, um, that item that you approved, was to amend the deadline for the Town Green agenda by 60 days. And the notice said to March 2nd, 2018. And I believe you meant March 2nd, 2019. But when you did the motion and approved it, no one caught that error. Um, and, I, you know, I um, usually read this ahead of time, and I called Tracy today, and she said it was, a, you know, a typographical error. But when you notice it wrong, and then you vote on it wrong. I don't know. So you guys get to decide that. But um, you know, if there was a Michael Schulman there, he would have caught the error. And it's you know, I know you go through a lot of material, but those dates may be important if someone there was ever a contestant. So just bring it to your attention. I don't know what you're going to do. May I ask the city attorney? Is that something we should? Um do you think we need further action, or was it? No, the date was not in the agenda. It was um, inadvertently included in the staff report, and obviously you wouldn't have approved an extension for a month that had already passed. So um, we've made that note. We've indicated it is March 2nd, 2019. Okay. Uh, thank you for pointing that out. Uh, I appreciate the attention to detail. Uh, any other comments on the part of the council? Okay. Um, or the public? Uh, then do I have a motion to approve Item 1B, on the set, what is now on the regular agenda. I should have pointed out when we approved what I called item uh, G on the, on the agenda, we were actually approving item 1A. It's, it's still item A. Okay. It so I want to be, do this right and be. Okay. <laughs> so now um, we have before us item 1B, which was item A on the consent agenda originally. Is there a motion for approval? So, <coughs> Second. All those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion passing unanimously. Thank you. So we'll move on. Are there any alterations to the regular agenda? Um, just one note that you have an informational handout that pertains to a regular agenda item number one. Thank you. Second. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion passed unanimously. So now we'll move on to item one on the uh, regular agenda, City Council Goals. City Manager Harriel. Thank you, Mayor, members of the Council. Oh, yeah. My little presentation for you. I'm going to wake up. All right. Um, so as you know, we're going to be discussing the 1920 goals uh, for um, the next fiscal year. 
And tonight what I'd like to do is just give you an update of where we're at with the goals that were established as a part of the 18-19 fiscal year. We'll do a review of the 10-year forecast and any assumptions that have been changed uh, since uh, the 2018 um, election in which we had a TOT uh, rate increase on there. And then also that will lead it to council discussion for 1920 goals and then part of that discussion will include what perhaps 1819 goals need to carry over and be further refined. So with that, uh, the 1819 goals, there were four main categories that council established. Uh, the first one was ensure long-term fiscal um, stability. Uh, the second one was to encourage um, our businesses and to expand our sales tax base. Uh, we also wanted to implement operational initiatives to enhance city services. And then the fourth was a new one uh, that the council hadn't had in prior years, and that was to maintain the quality of life for residents. And we had a variety of subject matters covered in that particular category. Um, the first, I wanted to run through a few items that have been done on ensure uh, long-term fiscal sustainability. As the council is aware, we had developed an FSP, and through that process, we identified a number of strategies. Uh, there is an implementation plan that was adopted by council in uh, the spring of 2018. Before you, as just a reminder, but some of the short-term strategies that we recently implemented, I think, are really important to note. Uh, the comprehensive fee study and the adjustment of fees um, to improve our cost recovery levels. That shifted our recovery level from about 60% to um, 80%. Uh, the development of an RFP so we could look at outsourcing our fleet maintenance is completed. Uh, we also were successful with Measure N. Um, thank you to the voters to increase our hotel tax by 1%. And then, of course, the receipt of SB transportation grants, um, about a million dollars. And so these are significant short-term strategies that were accomplished in um, less than a year. The other that I noted on here is the um, citywide fee study, which I had already covered. And again, that was a specific objective that council had asked um, that we move forward with. And then last is to educate and inform the community of basically our fiscal outlook and our situation. And we did um, a number of public meetings through this FSP development process. We also had a social media platform that covered many of those um, efforts. And so what I will need from council is direction on how you want to move this education forward as we embark on more deeper discussions about our fiscal situation. The next is encourage business development and expand the economic base. Uh, we have made huge strides on updating the general plan. Uh, we've had nine uh, GPAC meetings and we've reviewed almost and provided um, input to almost all of the elements. The last two that we have are land use and mobility. And as you know, the GPAC will be meeting on the 11th of February and we'll get started on that process. And the other is to facilitate uh, the town center and other complementary uses. And we've um, seen, uh, obviously, the construction of uh, the Starbucks and soon to be the hangar project. And so that was, of course, a successor agency parcel that was developed. And that was a huge um, win, I think, for the city to move that forward. And then, of course, we finished the um, exclusive negotiating agreement that was adopted by council. And that really was for us to facilitate the purchase agreement with the town center developers for city-owned property, as well as to begin the conceptual plan of um, conceptual plans for the town center and as you know we've had two community meetings uh, with the developers another one is scheduled and I believe that's scheduled for February 7th and there will be two meetings held that day one at 1 p.m. and one at 6 p.m. at the community center and then finally an occupancy permit was um, issued in December for the Four Point Sheraton so we were happy to see that come to fruition uh, the third is to implement operational initiatives to enhance city services uh, the council directed that we begin a citywide strategic technology plan, which is currently underway. We have a draft assessment uh, that's been completed, so staff will be reviewing that, and hopefully as a part of the budget development process, we'll bring you the results of that and seek direction on um, how we can begin to enhance our technology to improve services to residents. We updated the city's website. That was a really huge lift uh, by this organization, and my hat's off to staff for accomplishing that. And so that continues to be an ongoing process, and we will um, continue to build on our website and make that as robust as we can. And then the other item that was listed on here is exploring guidelines for standing and project-specific committees, and we'll have a conversation later this evening on that. And then the last is to maintain the quality of life for residents, um, and this is focusing the first on public safety 
And the police department was um, very successful in accomplishing many things. Uh, they put in security camera at the um, skateboard park. Uh, they currently finished the assessment of body cameras and they'll be looking at um, purchasing those and implementing them for the next fiscal year. They also partnered with local businesses in order to enforce trespassing and private property. This is a great partnership um, and we want to do our part to help our businesses. And then we updated the massage ordinance to be consistent with um, state law. And then the other is to research um, options to address housing affordability. Uh, while we've done some initial research on this, particularly looking at preference criteria as it relates to police officers and teachers, uh, we also wanted to do a best practice review, and we haven't quite um, completed that. We've had some turnover, and so uh, we are a little bit challenged on this, and so we will need some direction from council how they'd like us to proceed, kind of giving our limited staffing at this time. Uh, review of city business design standards. So over the past several months, as you know, the GPAC is going to continue to assess the mobility and the land use elements. And through this process, it might help to clarify some of our land use approaches uh, potentially will be impacting design and building and parking. And so one of the recommendations is perhaps let the GPAC go through that dialogue and see what comes out of that. And if we find that there are um, reasons for us to kind of further do a deep dive on this, then perhaps we can get some recommendations from the GPAC um, to kind of go down kind of the rabbit hole with this a little further, or perhaps we'll find that maybe there are some low-hanging fruit things that we don't need to do um, so deeply, but we can kind of correct some of the concerns. I know um, there was concern by the council making sure that our standards are what they need to be, particularly in the area of parking, because we have seen some challenges there. Uh, facilitate the development of the Glenwood Open Space Trail System. It was noted today, the West Trails are open. That's really exciting. That's the active side um, of the open space, and we are under construction for the East. And so, again, uh, we hope to have all the trails um, open and functioning by fall of 2019. This is a huge uh, win, I think, for the city, and again, something for us to position ourselves for marketing and branding. And I'm sure that'll be a future discussion tonight. And then um, one of the other goals was, why don't you look at creative solutions to address code enforcement given our limited capacity? Uh, we've really uh, been excited to bring on our new building official through a partnership with uh, Capitola. And so that's helped us to build capacity within the building inspector and our building official. And so we are um, being strategic about which type of code enforcement issues that we can address. Because once you kind of open that box, you need to go all the way, to, all the way through everything. And so we've really been able to move the needle on a few things. And in the past, we haven't been able to. So we're very excited to have some wins in that area. Oops. And so um, that's just a very brief overview. I would like to pause um, to answer any questions on this component before we move into a review of our forecast. And if there's no questions, I'd be happy to continue to go on. Uh, just a process question. Sure. Uh, it looks like you want us tonight to come up with some goals, and then you come back with a work plan that we could talk about. And so uh, uh, you propose then that we would go through these and determine whether or not we want to keep these as our goals? Um, I've goals. noted which ones are completed and which ones are ongoing, and I'll be definitely wanting some direction on which ones should carry over, and I do have a sense of which ones will if you need some um, input by, um, by me. Uh, but what I wanted to do is get through the fiscal uh, forecast to kind of give you a context mm -hmm. of what some of our challenges will be and how that might inform your goals around fiscal sustainability. So then we would go back to the, the goals. Yes. Okay, yes, you. absolutely. So if there's no questions, I'd like to um, turn um, this part of the presentation over to Tony McFarland, our Administrative Services Director, and he's going to go through our baseline forecast and then our updated forecast with some refined assumptions. So in the spring of uh, 2018, uh, the city adopted a, a fiscal sustainability plan uh, that was partially due based on a baseline scenario uh, that without some corrective measures that were being put into place, that we were looking at a structural deficit um, by fiscal year 2020-2021. Um, as part of the fiscal sustainability plan, uh, some of the corrective actions that were taken, um, one was increasing the transient occupancy tax to 12%. Uh, also, the measure, <clears throat> measure U sales tax, which is expiring, uh, increasing that to 0.75 and extending it. Uh, we were also looking at some service delivery changes, uh, vehicle fleet minutes that uh, Jenny 
had um, referred to earlier, or the city manager referred to earlier. And also looking at um, an online permitting process, which was going to be included in our strategic technology master plan. Um, with the adoption of the fiscal sustainability plan, um, if you can move to the next slide. Um, the goal was to have our reserves meeting our 17% uh, target goal of uh, reserve balances. Um, however, with the passage of the 1% TOT increase and some of the revenue projections that we had, including one was a new hotel as well, we've had to revise some of our revenue projections moving forward. And um, also, looking back at the forecast, um, there was not a true up done between the budget balance and the, the CAFR balance, which is our annual you know, financial report. So we trued up that amount, which extended our um, structural deficit one more year with the revised forecast. And as you can see here, we're still looking at a structural deficit by 2022-2023. Um, and the, the primarily what is driving that is the reduction uh, with our TOT projections with getting 1% instead of 2, so that reduced the projection by 50%. Also with the new hotel uh, not coming online, we pulled that out of the forecast altogether. Uh, so um, we're still looking at, um, again, as I said, a structural deficit by 2022-2023. And um, if there are any other questions or any questions, I'll be... Happy to answer those right now. Councilman um, I assume you haven't, this graph, uh, when it looks at expenditures, you're assuming that there's no change in the discount rate for PERS, right? You're assuming that everything's going to stay, stay status quo for the next several years, even though I think those of us who are looking at there, There are some rumblings from PERS that there's going to be a reduction of discount rate, but nothing is definite yet. Right, but you don't have anything. I do not have that. Right. So this, and, and I'm not faulting you, you're doing the right thing because you don't, we don't know what it's right. going to be or what size. I guess I'm just noting for the record for anybody <coughs> listening at home. I, I mean, it's obvious that, at so, you know, what's the old saying? If something can't go on forever, it won't. Right. We all know that discount rate is going to have to keep coming down. And every time it comes down, you know, a quarter point change has a huge impact on us, hundreds of thousands of dollars. Right. So as bad as this looks now, uh, and it was the right thing to do to pull out that, that, that extra hotel because we, we do have questions about where that stands. Um, there's no way this is gonna get worse. It seems to me this is gonna be better, get better before it's gonna get worse. It's gonna get worse. Because yeah. um, those discount rate changes, I have to believe, are, are coming at some point relatively soon. At some point, yes. Uh, but again, we have not received any right. direction from PERS of when it's gonna happen. Thank you. We're still we're still in the blind end or the down to seven percent. So, if I can add to that, I was at a finance conference the other week, and uh, um, I we heard from Joe Nation, who's a Stanford professor, who did a statewide um, study that's that's respected, and there's a whole variety of views. But the general message we heard was that um, yeah, you know, most people think that discount rate is going to have to go down. Um, the discount rate is. They use that to how to set, set the rates, but really it's the amount that CalPERS earns on its investments, on the money we give them to invest. And they've been assuming we earn more than we have been, and that because it, that earning hasn't happened, uh, it's caused the, the pension system to a lot of issues, so a lot of problems. So really, um, it is important to, to get a realistic discount rate. The problem is if they do it all at once, then they clobber us with extreme rate increases. We already have large rate increases. So it, it's, a, it's a difficult uh, issue, but um, Councilman Reed is correct. That's a real issue. It's a real risk. And uh, I guess I'm thinking things, things are going to look worse, not better, because of that. So it, it's good to keep that in mind. Right. And also, when we, when we did adopt the fiscal sustainability plan, the assumption was that there would be no changes in services over the next five years. So that is also built into the forecast that there has been no changes in current city services, so, but the cost increases are going up about 3% each year, which was again adopted when the FSP was adopted. So. I, I would like to um, just remind the council, so as you're given this information um, and you go back and give us direction with respect to fiscal sustainability, um, anything that can happen will can't happen um, when I'm kind of reflecting upon uh, Council Member Reed's comments. And so if there is interest in wanting to see what that might look like, because you are looking at the big picture here, we'd be happy to bring 
um, back that data for you so you have that snapshot as you're considering a lot of different other options because my guess is, is that we're going to have deeper conversations about what else we can explore and those might be the marching orders but if there are things that you would like us to bring back that shows um, what possibly could be so we're thinking more clearly on what uh, future uh, fiscal strategies we need to consider because this is a fluid document that is not only you know for next year or five years, it could be a broader look at things that we may have to have conversations with the community later on. So again, be happy to provide you any level of data that you may need. I have some feedback, but first, Vice Mayor Johnson. So while we're on the subject of PERS, so right now we make additional payments to PERS to cover some of the, the ongoing deficits, is that correct? We do make, it's called the UAL. Uh, payout, which is an additional amount on top of what we we uh, pay sure. yeah. And what percent is of the budget is that? Hmm. Um, it's less than because the total payment we made this past year, I believe, was almost a million. We may have been nine hundred thousand or so, um, which is that going up? It's going to go. Yeah, it's going to go up. Every year. Okay, so it's at least 10%. Yeah. And on top of that, we make pension obligation bond payments that are really retirement related, right? Mm -hmm. Yes. But yes, the contribution rates will, are, are going up and the UAL, the UAL payment is going up. But if we do a prepay, we do save some money at the initial part of the year. My expectation is, is that that million dollars is going to get close to doubling, and so you're probably going to look at about 20% of your budget. So that would be the reality. So just think about if there's another drop, double that again. Um, I would like to see a, an example of, um, and I don't have the right number, but even like a six and a half percent if the discount rate were to drop to that. And then the question would be, well, when's it going to drop? And that, so the other, right. we, know, of we know we have some colleagues next door that I know are doing some similar modeling. So we'd be happy to make a phone call and maybe compare some best practices on how they're going about their forecasts. I'm sure Tony has other contacts as well. That'd be helpful. Councilmember Reed? Uh, City Manager, in response to your question about, about timing, do you, could you give a just very broad, high level uh, kind of review for us? When are you planning to, as part of the budget process, or when are we, we've obviously got to have a very serious revenue conversation this year and next year. Um, do you have a current timetable about when we're going to start getting into that deeply? Um, is it just through the usual budget process, or uh, are we going to um, speed that up for a particular reason, just if you could give a, a broad timeline? That's a great question. Um, part of it is waiting to hear some of the feedback back from the council today, but I do envision that there would be a parallel process where we would be talking about what strategies you would like staff to pursue parallel to our budget development process in 1920. Um, and I would envision that this discussion would probably go on for at least um, another year, depending on what um, the opportunities are and when we would want to be looking at things uh, related to the ballot. And so we need to have those conversations now and get kind of our ducks in order. I know we will be having some conversations about options related to legislation, things of that nature. And those are triggers um, that we need to start pulling now so that we have that option in our toolbox, among other things. So to answer your question, over the next year, parallel to this process, and it could start as early as the uh, last meeting in February, depending on um, what council's feedback is and the work plan that I bring back to you, which I plan on doing February 6th, based on your direction this evening. So let's say that we didn't, <clears throat> excuse me, we didn't want to do anything different and we were going to stay with the usual um, timetable for reviewing budget. When, is that April that you would start the process of kind of the, the long-term fiscal analysis as part of budgetary approval? Uh, we would be starting probably as soon as this month based on um, some of the feedback we're getting from your goals because your goals kind of help guide the budget. So I would envision we could come um, to you as early as March where we would begin the CIP prioritization, um, April with fees, and then May would be probably more of the operating budget discussion. Okay. Mayor, a, a question for you, and I, I don't have a preference however you'd like to do this. I, I, do we want, you know, now that we're kind of focusing on the, the fiscal aspect here, do we want to start to, to throw out some ideas that we might have around goals, or do you want to wait until we get done with all the presentations um, before, we, before we start that process? Um, well, 
Well, let me ask, um, are you close to finishing the presentation? Why, yes, we are. If you look at the slide, we're going to get the next step. Thank you. Oh, that. Thank you. You are fantastic. How's that for transition? So in that regard, uh, it makes sense to, um, to you know, to certainly, okay. and, and it is kind of what do we talk about first, but to me, the financial part of this is 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 the the, the big, I don't know, the big monkey, for lack of a better term, yep. but it's the big issue, and it colors everything we do. Yep. So I think it's very appropriate to begin talking about um, uh, how finances affect all this, just for sake of uh, having some kind of logic to what we're doing, it kind of makes sense to me to just go through this list the way it's laid out in front of us. And of course, the first topic is about finances. So, Great. So I'm, I'm sorry. Can I a point of clarification on this sheet where it says the revenue enhancements and then uh, TOT tax increased to 12 percent? Are you, you see Action was taken after that document, so it sh so in hindsight it should be 11%. Okay, I got you. Okay. All right. So, because, so that, that, that confused me a little bit, because you had June 2018. My apologies, I, I knew that in my gut, I should have said something. Thank you for that clarification. Not a problem. So does that make sense for the rest of the council that we go through this list in the way it's laid out? And then obviously if we don't cover something, we can we can talk about that later, or if it fits, we can insert it along the way. That works. So, Mayor, is this time for us to, if we wanted to start shooting some specifics in here? Yes. Good. By all means. Thank you. Yes. Um, so one thought that I had, um, so I, I think it's, I'm not speaking for the rest of us, at the same time I'll be stunned if, if, if we all don't agree that uh, the long-term uh, fiscal sustainability is going to be our top priority for this year and next. Um, so that's obviously got to remain as a goal. And um, I think the, the, the thing that's really important is the third item that we have here about engaging and educating the community. And what, what comes to mind um, is the effort that Derek led and, and, and I had helped with when we started the education campaign for the parcel tax. You know, there was a preliminary poll that came back that showed uh, a, a market difference in how uh, grave the public perceived the school district's need this last time compared to previous efforts and so the solution to that was a, a very prolonged systematic education campaign. Um, Derek did a masterful job of it but you know it was social media, it was going out to groups, it was um, just a ton of engagement taking advantage of the time that we have before we're going to need something. So really making sure that we use, you know, let's assume there's going to be a ballot measure in, in, in March or November next year, but really using this as time to just make sure people understand what's really at stake. And so I guess a thought that I would have, um, I'd like to see if the budget subcommittee, if the council thinks that's an appropriate venue, that the budget subcommittee really take ownership of, of this item and meet with city staff on a regular basis and, and come up with a public education campaign that can, you know, again, fly in concert with the content that you're bringing to us uh, to just make sure that there's a systematic way we're doing outreach so that people can understand what's really at stake here. Go ahead. Can I ask how what other council members feel about that? About having the budget subcommittee, which is typically, I know we will be, uh, uh, next item is about uh, who's on which agendas, but I mean, which committees, but normally it would be the main vice mayor that would be on that budget committee. Yes? So I'll add to what, what Jim, uh, Councilmember Reed just stated is, is when we decided to take on that effort, the most recent effort with the school district, um, and we polled our community, the biggest issue we found was uh, only 23% of the community believed that we had a serious financial issue. Um, the district was in dire straits. Uh, yet the public perception among parents and community members was everything was rosy because the scores were good. So right now I think the, the community perception, uh, and talking to people in public uh, recently during the campaign, is hey, the city seems to be doing okay. I don't think there's a public awareness of how bad our budget situation is, and the, and the chart that, that was just put up by Tony is, uh, it should scare uh, the bejesus out of everyone because we're in serious trouble. So um, how do you convey that? Uh, I'll just say the, the school district started with a poll of the community, um, which determined you know, where it sat and what were the, the items that um, 
uh, were important to the community. Where they were able to discover where they were falling short on their education and, and what people would support. Um, you know, we might want to consider uh, something along those lines to determine exactly where the community sits on this. And that also, a poll serves a dual function. It also helps educate the community when people hear it. And they learn, oh my gosh, uh, these, are, these are real issues that we're facing. And then, and then your job as the budget subcommittee becomes going around and talking to everyone. It's, you know, it's now, I think the, the rule of thumb now is seven times. Uh, someone has to hear a message because it used to be three. Right? You advertise things three times and you get the, the picture and now it's seven. So uh, we're, you really will have to work hard at that. So um, uh, anyway, I just wanted to add to what uh, Councilmember Reed stated. And if I can add, um, yeah, you did a wonderful job with, with the school, uh, school uh, parcel tax issues. I would love to see us have all kinds of community meetings. Now, it would take a lot of work, but I know, um, and, and on some level, people care passionately about their kids. So we need to somehow tap into a similar passion. Uh, and certainly people care very much about public safety. They care very much uh, about our recreation. They care very much about our streets and our parks. And so we need to somehow bring that alive. And I agree that the, the kind of graphs we're seeing on, I, I like my blood graphs, but I think most people can see that. So uh, it might be a little bit harder of a sales pitch than it is with schools, um, but I think we can make the case. And uh, so I think I see it as an all-out uh, job not to, um, to not to push anybody down, down the track, but to say, here's where we are. We need your help. Um, so I, I think we, and I've been hearing from other cities that you do need at least a year to mirror what the city manager said. Um, to to bring something along so the public is aware of the need for it. So I think I think we're on the same page. With yes, yeah. I I agree with what's been said. I know we found at the league uh, conference last year there was some uh, actually um, I think most of us attended a presentation on some other cities that have been successful and some that had faced challenges. What worked, what didn't work, um, things they learned. Um, but all of them talked about really getting a positive message out and actually rather than we think about going out with the diary, going out on the positives, we have this great you know, community, we have a safe community, and, and we want to continue that. And um, really the importance of, of repeated messages and different approaches and not uh, any one um, method, but really reaching out in various ways. So, it sounds like so far we're all on the same page, and and uh, and I agree. It's a it's a diet. We you know we are facing some really scary times. Vice so. Mayor Joseph, <clears throat> thank you, Mayor. So you know under the umbrella of quality of life, I think you can kind of put things like you know what what is good about Scotts Valley and what do you want to keep, mm -hmm. and uh, and so there's a there's a positive message there, and to to the extent that. You know, you mentioned school districts versus cities. Um, you know, this goes back almost 20 years, but, you know, Measure D was Scotts Valley Drive, and Measures G and H were to build a high school, and I worked on both of those. I was the, kind of the primary person on Measure D to, to, to rebuild Scotts Valley Drive, but I was like a worker bee for Measures G and H to build a high school. So in June of that year, the school district and a few people got together and said, hey, we got to build a high school here. And literally there were 60 people that showed up as volunteers. And I tried the same thing when I called, you know, called to arms for, for to rebuild Scotts Valley High, and three people showed up. So there is a difference. I mean, schools are different because kids, uh, parents are much more passionate about their kids. They have interaction on a daily basis. Okay, with their kids, how things are going at schools, teachers, and whatever. Um, so bringing that home, I mean, it's one thing to, you know, teachers are important, and let's just say for argument's sake, and I mean this, police obviously are important for our safety, uh, but sometimes the connection isn't exactly the same. The emotional connection is not really there because, you know, our police are protecting the whole community, Teachers are fully engaged in protecting our kids, and it's just it just reaches a gut level that people understand, and they'll you know walk through walls and do whatever it is to to kind of make sure that uh, you know that stays intact. Um, 
So, you know, what do you do? Um, I, you know, I'm seeing here, and I guess uh, on this sheet, if we want to fully more discuss things in terms of revenue enhancement, <clears throat> you know, I, I've seen TOT and I've seen sales tax, um, but I don't think we can really forget about the utility tax that we do, okay? Um, you know, Santa Cruz taxes everything that moves, okay? And hi, okay. Uh, I'm talking about, you know, I think cell phones, uh, your telephone, you know, you mentioned it. I don't know if we want to go that far, but I do know that a 4% on pg &E, I think is the extent of our taxation there. And sometimes, you know, um, you know, it's all well and good for, for, for Comcast and for Verizon to have their $200 a month bills and all that other stuff. Um, but there's also, like, where's the love? You know, where's the, you know, in terms of almost like a franchise fee that we do with our garbage people, um, you know, to enhance that a little bit. Because we, have to, we do have to make a choice, okay? What is important, the quality of life for this community? And, you know, we need to distill it, <clears throat> you know, safety for our citizens, for our children, uh, decent parks, quality of life. How do you maintain <coughs> it? And, you know, I think you have to point out the positives, but I think risk of losing something is also a very, very strong motivator that people have. Uh, they don't want to lose those things. And if you, uh, you know, to Derek, your point, you know, you have to tell those things to me sometimes so I can really understand them. But, uh, to your point, getting that message across um, that we we are fully committed to provide what people have been been accustomed to, namely, this community is special. How do we keep that? Okay. So if we can if we can pursue that with all cylinders running and and make the case, then I think all things are possible. Um, but it has to be a compelling argument, and it has to be something that I think people just feel, and that they know that it's authentic and real. Um, uh, you know, um, Council Member Reed and I have talked many, many times about the number of people that have left this community and then either come back or yearn to come back because they've never really had a place kind of like this. Okay, so I think that's a like a fair starting point for us to kind of focus on as to why are we special and why do we, and, and how do we teach it that way. That's all I've got to say. Just one I one of the parent one of the people I talked to yesterday I think it was talked about moving here because they wanted to raise their children whether it could be safe that they could walk to school that they wouldn't worry. And that is a common theme we hear is people came here from other areas because they want to feel safe and our schools and they, you know I mean it's this is that environment, and that's you know what we what we stand to risk is you know if we can't continue the safety and provide the services, we won't be that same community that that uh, Vice Mayor Johnson's talking about. So, Mayor, on this so on this item, uh, in addition to a, a specific uh, reference to the budget subcommittee, sort of being charged with steering a public education campaign. I'd like to also add a specific, um, and I don't do this lightly because I know how, how harried staff is at the same time, I think we should really spend some time exploring what cuts would look like. And, and so it's not just theoretical to people. Uh, you know, if, if we don't have an answer to that graph, um, here's what your parks look like. We're not going to be able to replace the playground equipment, the grass is going to be a foot tall. Um, here's what retention rates and police officer studies show are going to happen to our outstanding police force if we can't do a better job keeping pay with, with surrounding jurisdictions. So I know when we had this exercise a year ago, um, the council was basically, um, we had a facilitator and we all kind of agreed on the council, okay, we don't even want to talk about cuts of these types, right? Because we all knew they were so deep, they didn't make sense to any of us. I'm, I'm guessing that's still the case. At the same time, being able to show with some specificity why the, these aren't palatable options, I think for somebody who's on the fence or maybe doesn't understand why the need is so great, having a little bit of specificity 
uh, involved there, and, and I don't I don't know how much detail I'm asking for, but something that we can quantify, so that people understand it's a choice between X and more taxes to preserve what you have, and here's what happens. Here's the alternative. So it sounds like these are kind of your sound bites, if you will, for your campaign, and kind of drilling down on what those impacts are. Yeah, um, it could be used for that purpose, but that's not why I'm bringing it up. It's just being able to to educate the public about what's truly at stake here. Um, so I guess if we could add, I would suggest we add a specific component that includes realistic cut scenarios. And those would be the only two things I'd have for that item, Mayor. I'm not sure I want to go there. Um, I understand exactly what you're saying because um, there are consequences. There would be consequences, but I believe we will um, scare our employees um, and we'll maybe scare the public as well. And maybe that's well. And, and I'm not saying it's inappropriate. But I, I would say I, it wouldn't. It, it could really be a consequence, but I don't really want to paint that picture. I would rather take another push. So let me float a, an alternative idea. Um, I was not involved with the city over the last couple tax measures, the sales tax measures. I was here working for the city, I think it was 1994 when we adopted, the council adopted the uh, um, utility users tax. I was a staff person, I was the finance director. And um, I remember what we did was we formed a community committee. Now the school district did something very similar, uh, or I should say the community did it, working for school issues. Um, and we had some of the most, I've never been in a room with such conservative people. They were the most conservative folks, and, and, and that was good. It was financial conservatism, but that's what, that's what I mean by conservative. Conservative bankers and other folks, and they looked at our finances, and, and we knew we were having problems. This is when the state was doing a lot of takeaways, um, ERAF and so forth, uh, back in the this was early 90s. And um, they, we wanted them to come in and look at our finances and, and dare them to what could we cut? And they looked at that and they came back and said, you know what, we really can't cut. Uh, the only thing to do, so here we basically had the community um, coming forth and saying, uh, we need this tax. And we arrived at the, the council arrived at the 4% um, uh, utility use tax just on gas and electric. And it was, now Chuck Comstock, the city manager, sat in those meetings, I sat in those meetings. But it was about 12 people, local people, who really pushed it. And it was a committee that answered directly to the council. And they had a spokesperson they, they made the presentation. And, uh, and it was hard to argue with it, because they were conservative. They looked at our numbers and said, you have, to, um, you have to have a tax increase, because you just can't afford to cut anything. Now, interestingly, I look back at employee numbers, and at least I think in 1997 we had 86 employees in the city, about the same number as the police as we have now, and we now I think I have 66. So we've cut about 20 positions, less. even though we haven't cut. Yeah, we have less than that. Yeah. 50, 50, 50, 50, 50, 50, 50, 50. Okay. And um, so we are much tighter now. We we have cut. We've had to along the way, and we've done it. I'm guessing we've done it incrementally wherever we could. Um, and I know there were good reasons why we, we had to do that, but I just don't see the capacity to cut. So I would much rather uh, approach from a perspective of if we could do this, bring a community, uh, um, I'm not talking about a ballot measure committee, I'm talking about a group of committee to come in as maybe a finance committee, uh, hopefully not take too long, but come in if we could find the right people and look at our, because uh, I really, I know we had a discussion as Councilmember Reed mentioned a year ago, where we went through and we talked about, yeah, we have to start, we have to look at cuts, we have to look at contracting out, and we have to look at revenues. And we looked at it and said, well, we really can't cut much. We don't really want to go there. And I respect the fact that it's always good to ask that question. I'm just not sure I want to rattle everything. I guess I'd be open to that if we thought we had no other choice. But rather, I would rather first come see if there's a, a more positive way, if you will, of saying we have to do this without frightening everybody. Um, and that may not be a precise, but I'm trying to get my point across. This. It's an alternative, I believe. Yeah. Um, yes, I have a question. So, um, I, not, 1996 is when the utility tax measure went on the ballot, because I went on the ballot the very first year, I'm sorry to say. 
Um, and I remember that campaign very well because it was a group of citizens. I think you, you were very right. It was conservative, yet I forget the name of the guy in Casaway, the Tom something or other. Probably oh, failing? Failing. 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 Um, uh, CPAs and whatever. So you're, you're right in terms of uh, the composition of that committee in terms of talking about, quote, the dire uh, position that the city was in. But I think what you left out was the fact that that, that that measure, which was on the ballot, failed miserably. It got less than, it got less than I think it needed uh, two-thirds, and I think it got 40%. So um, I, think, I think the template that has been described by, um, by um, Derek Tim in terms of, you know, co continually talking about uh, because he mentioned it, 23% of the people thought uh, things were bad, everybody else th thought it was rosy. Um, I'm not worried about, I'm not worried so much about scaring people, and I'm not particularly worried about scaring employees. These are realities, okay? So, um, you know, if, if somebody from, from, uh, from executive staff has to uh, educate employees about this is the way it is, um, but the community has to be educated, and a group of people with best intentions. And oh, by the way, you're going to be the, the the people that give this a stamp of uh, authenticity. Um, I think we have that. We already have authenticity as as a, as a city and a council and a, a, as a uh, um, a group of a staff and so forth. Um, to the to the extent that we cut, you know. Many, many. We're not. We're dealing with uh, f fewer and fewer employees. Um, I think. I think we have to take. Uh, you know what Derek says is real. That you have to have a campaign that goes over and over and over, stating both. You know the yin and the yang, the positive and the negative, and those things work. Um, and you know, I think your point about bringing in a, 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 a you know citizens. Um, group to, to kind of validate, um, you can kind of do that on the side, but the main focus has to be a real, positive, uh, full-throated campaign that goes to the heart from, all the way from, I think um, uh, Council Member Reed described it, and maybe starting with a poll, talking, talking about exactly what is needed, having a having unanimous uh, consent probably among the council in terms of what the best way to go and then just hit it hard and then when you do that uh, you have a chance of winning and so um, forgive me uh, council member Reed, I didn't mean to jump in here as well Reed. no 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 that's that's okay I was just gonna say I appreciate the mayor's points you know I, as I kind of think through how this is going to happen though if you convene a committee you know people don't want to raise their taxes if they don't think there's something in it for them and so their people aren't going to say raise my taxes without knowing what the alternative is and so if you convene a committee it's going to very quickly become well what are our options and for us to show what the options are why revenues have to be raised i don't know how you have that discussion without showing the alternative uh, i guess that'd be my first point so even if you convene a committee we're going to have to do the work that i'm talking about it would seem to me um, and I guess the second thing, I'm not worried at all about what the employees think, because I don't know a single employee that is very, very well aware of our situation. The folks who aren't necessarily aware is the community. And so the employees are going to be fine, and the community needs to know what's at stake to make an important decision. Um, fear uh, motivates voter behavior better than anything else. And in our case, it wouldn't be fear mongering to talk about these things. It's reality, to Council Member Johnson's point. Yeah, if I could add, um, you know, the school district did not want to talk about the fact, they didn't want to give out pink slips to teachers, but they had to. Uh, they didn't want to talk about the potential of closing the library. They didn't want to talk about uh, some of the things that were reality that, that parcel tax didn't pass. Um, you know, there was even a discussion of whether they would have to close one of the campuses, which was kind of the nuclear option for them. Uh, but if you look at our budget and we're four million in the hole or five million in the hole a few years out, like what, like paint the picture of what the city looks like without that money. 
right? And then that, that becomes a very different city than what we're used to. You know, you don't have, you know, two to three minute response times from the police force. You don't have uh, some of the services we're used to. And, we're in, in, and I don't think you can tell the story to the community without letting them know, well, this is, this is what Scotts Valley looks like if we don't have these funds. And that's the scary thing. And it's scary to talk about. I mean, we don't want to be the council that lets that happen. So um, I think you have to have, and I think that's a real discussion. And I think to, to Council Member Reed's point, um, I think the employees know that our, our every every city it's we're we're not alone in this. This is the the topic of discussion at the League of Cities. But one of their big discussions is you are all going broke. So how do you avoid it? Right? I mean that is what we're talking about at a statewide level because of the way PERS has been set up. And that's not our fault, but we have to solve it nonetheless. So how do we do it? Well, we have to, to educate the public about how this happened and how we're going to correct it. I, I that would be my. Vice Mayor Johnson. So I, excuse me, so I guess embedded in that, there is a story to tell. And, you know, this, this story, like any good story, you know, has um, both um, kind of a protagonist and antagonist and, and, and everything. But, you know, I, I think embedded in our, <clears throat> excuse me, in this story is the fact that the city's done pretty much everything it can to kind of cut you know, expenses. Um, it gives us no pleasure to kind of have to, oh, uh, a person's retiring, well, I guess we won't fill that position, okay? Because, you know, at some point, there, there's a point of diminishing returns, okay? I mean, as a council, we don't want to waste money and we don't want people um, there who are there unnecessarily. But I think we kind of reach that point, okay? Because what happens is that, um, not only do you diminish the services for the community, but you enhance the possibility of people leaving because the workload, uh, you know, people are now working instead of 100%, they're working 110%. And that takes a toll on them, especially, you know, a lot of our employees are, um, they're not my age, but they are, you know, uh, they've been here for a while. And so they don't have, you know, they just don't have the, the wherewithal to kind of put in, you know, 60, 70 hours when really they should be working 40 or 45. So anyway, I think, I think we have a decent story to tell. Uh, it's an authentic story. And I think that's the key because that's one of the reasons why, um, you know, there may be small reasons why the community may not like a decision that the council makes or over here, I, that was crazy that you did this or whatever. But on balance, we've been able to kind of just hold on to the trust of this community because we're trying to do the right thing. And I think, you know, just looking out, um, people having a chance to kind of absorb who we are and what this community is, uh, the results kind, of, results kind of speak for themselves. The only thing I would add is that I, I agree, I've had employees contacting me for months now, worrying about sustainability of the city and, and um, even retirees contacting me because thinking if the city were to go under, contract out, um, you know, um, how they're going to be able to pay the bills and the risk of losing that pension and losing their income. And there's, you know, th there's um, definitely a lot of worry. And the good thing is some of those retirees are researching and sending me good information. They're motivated to, to find those facts. So that part is not um, as much concern. And it's just, I think, um, using and being, you know, just the things that we learned from the conferences, you can do it in a positive way and still get the message out and keep it real. And there was just a lot of good information, but the important thing was communicating and getting that information and educating. And I think we're all talking the same on that. So thank you. Yeah, I agree. We have a, a very good story to tell. The council has, um, the city has uh, taken so many steps with cutting costs, contracting out where we go, um, working with Capitola to share a building official, um, reducing positions when we had to. We do have a good story. I mean, we can look the public in the eye and say, we've minimized our costs. So you're right. We have to, I guess, and you know, I, I'm understanding why it is necessary to sell it, but I'm hoping we could have the you know, 
part of that message would be obviously, I know we've used the word in the past, preserve. Preserve our services. And um, I, I, well, you know, it, it's, it's a, it's a, it's a, there's a, a risk there. I, I'm agreeing we need to describe the risk and what it is, but I, I still believe sometimes you can gather, you know, you get, people listen to you more if you can focus on the positive instead of the negative. But I also know Pacifica, where I grew up, they had a fire suppression uh, assessment uh, for their fire folks uh, back, I forget how long ago, 15 years ago. And they were telling the public, and a very, at that time they were a very anti-tax city. Um, and they said, you know, we have two fire stations, one at either end. If you don't approve this tax, we're going to close one of those fire stations. And so I'm remembering that. And that was the message, and it worked. It, uh, the public approved it overwhelmingly uh, because nobody wanted to live at the end of town where there was no, no fire station. Um, so I get that. I just uh, just uncomfortable with the, the negative, but you know we'll work through that and find sure we'll find the, the best. And certainly we want to be honest with the public. I can totally appreciate that and not not hide anything. And we're not hiding anything. I mean we are we are where we are. I just want to touch briefly on the uh, um, the vice mayor touched on. The issue, the, the possibility of the change in the utility uses tax. And our rate is far lower and far narrower. Santa Cruz, by the way, also taxes water, sewer, and garbage. I think it's at the 7% rate. Um, so they have a very broad uh, tax, and we're nowhere near that. We collect just a, a, a smidgen of, of, a, of what they collect. And uh, the reason I do like, I do and I don't like utility use tax, I like it because. It's very stable and predictable. So um, that's a good thing from a budget side. We don't have to have as much money in our reserves if we have a stable budget. Uh, it's predictable. People pay utility bills. The downside is it's, a, it's on the regressive side. It tends to tax folks um, of less income more, but it's very stable. Uh, on the other hand, you know, sales tax and uh, hotel taxes that we're talking about and have been doing uh, are very volatile. And so as the economy goes up and down, our budget goes up and down, um, which to me says maybe that's the way to go because we can still raise the same amount of revenue and we love it when visitors pay us. Sales taxes are paid a lot by visitors and hotel, hotel taxes are paid totally by visitors. Um, so ideally we'd have a, have a mix of these, but I also know we don't want to sell too many taxes at the same time to our public. Um, so my concern is that if we as we do the sales tax, hotel tax, that we need to keep an eye on the reserves and maybe push up that 17% because there will be times when that volatility will, will come back and come back and get us. Um, anyway, so I think we're I think we're all saying the same thing. We're getting to the same place. So Mayor, could I just summarize yes. what I think I heard and then where I need some further clarity? So I heard um, a priority for this council is the engagement of the community. Um, developing a public campaign to improve awareness of what our situation is, using um, the budget subcommittee as um, a mechanism into de further developing that approach, which could involve uh, polling, also collecting some additional data on how this impact would affect services, police, parks, whatnot, and that the committee could be kind of your umbrella to further um, kind of refine what that approach would be. This would come back to council as a recommendation, so there's another bite at the apple. Um, I also heard some interest in exploring a modernization of a UUT. Um, I've heard some comment about the hotel tax, so where I'm really looking for clarification is what would council like um, brought back, if at all, um, any other additional um, expenditure or revenue um, enhancements, reductions, exploratory, things that were not on the FSP that you would like to discuss? or. Would your priority like to first out of the gate the engagement piece and let that drive what we ultimately bring back or can be done in a parallel process? Thank you. So, um, you know, we concentrate a lot on uh, sustainability on, uh, on this agenda and discussion, um, goals and objectives, but there are other goals and objectives. A lot of them kind of revolve around things like improvement in parks and, you know, a variety variety of, of, of capital improvements. So are you are we going to suspend that conversation later in the year like we normally do during the budget budget process for as far as capital improvements? In other words, um, you know, uh, 
enhancing, you know, the dog park. I mean, I'm just using that as an example. I'm, um, you know, the park on the other end of town. Um, we're not going to suspend any conversations. We would definitely bring forward to you a capital um, project for your consideration. We'd be looking for council to prioritize that based on um, funding. We also would want to be cognizant of absolutely doing the things that we need to do to try to preserve our reserves, and we would have some um, suggested recommendations for that. But we would have that conversation as part of the budget development process. Right, and that's going to come later, though. That will come later, probably in about a, a month. And um, some of those things are funds that can only be used for our parks that can't be, they're not available too for... Uh, if you're talking about impact yes. fees, those are restricted to yeah. new things. Yeah, I mean there are some things that we'll still be needing to deal with it that can't be used for general fund or to address our issues. Yes. Yeah. Councilman Reed. Thank you, Mayor. Um, so, Jenny, I like your summary very, very much. Thank you for doing that. I would have two tweaks. Um, one would be the community engagement piece. I'm not saying that's not important, but that is not the first thing I think we should move forward with uh, at all. I think it would be counterproductive. I think the first thing that needs to happen is staff work um, uh, that, that assesses options and then that is shared with the council. And then I think once we, council kind of gets uh, our heads around where we're at, then we sort of pick the next step on community engagement. At the same time, I do think it's important that the budget committee um, uh, put a parallel plan together about engaging at a higher level. What, I guess what I'm worried about, I don't, I don't like the idea of convening a committee of people until we have something specific we want them to assess. So I don't, I don't think that should be part of, uh, of our immediate next steps. Maybe it is down the road, but I don't see that as being an immediate uh, next step. And I guess um, for the guidance you requested on revenue options to come back, my thought would be why don't you come back you know, as part of the normal budget process. Um, we can have, you know, you can lay out all the different scenarios, all the different ways we can get to what we need. Um, and I do think it's important that uh, that discussion accompany specific alternatives, which mean cuts, so that people can, can see this is not a theoretical discussion about the proper level of government taxation. This is about services that you, we benefit from that are at risk if we don't take action. So um, and to the, the point the Vice Mayor made earlier, I, I fully agree that, that um, uh, a hopeful, optimistic message is, is, is not precluded by having these scenarios prepared. If you look at the messaging that we've used in the two successful um, sales tax campaigns, I think that was arguably, uh, if not the leading message, certainly a leading message. But this is not an either or, it's an and. I think we have to be able to talk about both so people can, uh, can make an informed decision. So was that useful in terms of guidance that you were asking for? Um, yes, and I would ask um, in terms of things. So I heard specific revenue measure, but what I didn't hear is um, because three quarters is not enough, what the option Oh, absolutely. Be. Yeah, so to me, bring, so bring back everything. So we've heard people talk about TOT. If, if, if we want to talk about uh, utility users tax, on sales tax, absolutely. You know, we, let's look at three quarters. Let's look at if there's some people who think it needs to be reduced. If some people think it needs to go up, let's look at all of those options. Thank you. I just didn't want to assume. Thank you. Just a quick one more. Just, just um, we have a lot of material that has been mentioned from the workshop last year that address some of those priorities and things, and that might be some things we may need to revisit and that are probably available to us. Correct, the one that we haven't done um, a lot of data collection on yet and are just beginning is looking at what it takes to exceed the cap, if that is an option right. that council wants yeah, to explore. It was not yeah. something discussed then. So. Yes, we do have data on the UUT. We have information right. on the three-quarter cent and um, fees and whatnot. Yeah, a lot of that work was work we did that applies now. Actually, go ahead. Go ahead. Something Jenny said, just kind of a tangent. I, so, um, if you want to, I can try to bring that up now. Which, which? So, uh, Jenny just brought up the point about the sales tax uh, amount, and and potentially, if we're going to go up a quarter of a cent, we're going to need a, a higher. We're going to need the cap to be lifted in Sacramento. Do you feel that you have the authority to formally ask our representatives to consider? 
uh, coming, bringing options to us, it, what it would look like to raise that cap? I, I don't have formal authority from this council to do that, and so that's what I would need. Can we give that to you now? Because it hasn't been agendized? Yes. Your attorney says no. Okay, so so you're not you don't have you don't have the authority to ask our assembly member as a as a theoretical option. Tell you what, why don't we stop right there? I don't want to hear what you have to say, Kirsten. As much as I love everything you have to say, let's take this offline rather than doing this uh, in, in public, and um, we'll just table. Thank you very much. Well, if, and I appreciate that. But this will. And I say whatever we do in that regard, it, it could be a parallel. Because we're going to have at least a year, as we heard. Once we start talking to the community, that's at least a year. So on the subject of timing, I'd like to, to I appreciate everything you said. But for me, I, and I agree with you, um, Councilman Marie, that um, we probably shouldn't start the conversation with the community until we have our facts together. And yet I'm not sure why we need to wait till we go through our whole budget process to do that. I think we have enough information now to, for staff to come back to us with these options, and we could have a good discussion about that uh, before the budget, new budget comes out. We have updated um, uh, projections on our finances, and I think that's enough money, uh, enough information to be able to quantify some options for us. So I'd love to see us pretty quickly look at that list, figure out what we might, um, conceptually what we might ask the interface with the community about and, and how much guidance we need from them, whether this versus that, or if we thought we might know enough to know how to move ahead. So I'd rather not wait for budget. I'd rather jump into the options now, bring it back pretty quickly, uh, but I agree, then have that um, focus, that initial um, conclusion about where we want to head and how we want to do it um, before we start engaging. So two points would be I don't know, I don't know how you can have the conversation start to have the conversation in a detailed systematic way now without basically just having the entire budget conversation now you can't have an informed discussion about revenue options or timing or amounts unless we ha understand exactly what the alternatives are and so it seems to be the discussion that you're asking for that we have now basically is the budget discussion and it's going to take time for Jenny to pull that together so. I don't see, to me, it's, it, it makes sense to wait. We, we, either, we either front load our, we either tell Jenny we want to start the budget discussion right now, or we do it when the budget discussion is normally held, I guess I would say number one. And of course, the second thing is, you know, having a process for community outreach, I'm not against it at the same time, the notion, I know we all understand how much on a daily and weekly basis we interact with the community on this subject and have been interacting with the community for years. So it's not like we're starting from a vacuum, and it's not like if we were to convene a committee of 12 people, that's going to be the first time Scotts Valley is engaging on this subject, far from it. So um, again, I don't feel that, I think, I, I don't think we should convene a citizen committee now. Um, I think that should wait. And if you're comfortable speeding up the entire budget process, because again, I don't understand how we can make an informed decision on any revenue option unless we understand the alternatives. If you're comfortable putting the entire budget process, speeding it up, then I'm fine with that. But I mean, that's basically, I think, what the, what the mayor's proposing. Vice Mayor? Thank you. So, and I think another consideration is, you know, when you go to the public in a formal sort of way, namely, you want them to vote a certain way, a campaign really has a shelf life. In other words, you know, you don't want to, um, it's not, it's not like saying, um, you know, we're going to start right now and, and over the next, you know, 15 months, you know, this is going to be our campaign. It doesn't quite work that way because people get, you know, you, you have to have kind of a climax in terms of their interests and, and the, the climax kind of comes when they vote and say yes or no. And so usually... Uh, you know, uh, three, four, or five months out is when you start it, and you, it, it slowly builds, and then you have an election, and uh, it either wins or it doesn't. So, um, I think there's a something of a slow burn, you know, that you know that, that people you engage on a kind of an informal basis, 
but the real campaign, if you're going to have a campaign, um, has to follow, you know, a, a template of success, and we kind of know what that is because we've all, you know, we've been through uh, measures. Uh, Derek's been through it. You know, um, Jim Reed and I have have done and Don have done. Um, you know, sales tax measures and so forth. So that, that's, that's, I think, the direction we want to go. Okay. I, I hear you. I'm just, uh, I'm just seeing this year, probably plus more than a year, and I appreciate shelf life, but we've heard from so many folks that you, to do a thorough job when you have, have to sell a tax measure, it, it, it's a year. So that puts us, if we started today, uh, it's not, you know, we're, well, we're not starting today, but if we started by, I don't know, March, say, that's putting it into almost mid-next year, and maybe that's just enough time to get it on the ballot in November of 20, and maybe this would all work. But if it doesn't pass for some reason, we want to make sure we have a second bite to come back. And that would be, we'd have to declare a fiscal emergency, maybe and bring something in 2021. It might be more expensive for the ballot measure because now we're not, it's not, um, on a regular uh, ballot for other purposes, but you know that would be where we would be. So maybe there's enough time, but I guess I just want to get started so that we know we we fix our issue and we don't uh, we minimize the risk. The other risk we run in waiting too long, if if that were the case, is we are going to have a recession, and when we have a recession, it's going to be harder to convince our taxpayers to to vote for a tax measure, um, and so I. I worry about that. I know we factored, I believe, factored recession into the numbers already every so often, but um, uh, so I'm concerned about recessions and the length of time it will take, and yet obviously I want us all to be together on this. That's, we really need uh, to agree on this collaboratively. Yes? I think that's oh, yes. Well, I, you know, <clears throat> um, I do think if you're going to time it, November of 2020 would probably be a good time. I can't you know, speak to the recession issue, which actually is a real uh, concern in our world today uh, and would be concern for a, a campaign. Uh, but I think that uh, that timing is probably correct. But a lot of that will come back to you. And, you know, when, when we went through these uh, gyrations uh, with the school district a couple different times, um, you know, if, you, if your subcommittee does choose to do a poll, the pollster will make recommendations on when you go out, uh, how you best position it, and all those sort of things. So, you know, we're kind of, we're getting ahead of ourselves a little bit, and I think to Jim's point, we want to hear from the city manager, what are our options, what do we need, what does it look like, and I, and I think when we hear that information come back, then we're able to make an informed decision on, okay, well, yeah, let's, let's put this committee together. And what we did with the school district is we picked a few people that we knew understood the issues. We had two board members, of course, right? Um, I sat on that committee because uh, I was head of the Ed Foundation and, and had run a previous measure. And, and we pulled in a couple other uh, critical people from the district and worked on what our plan was for the campaign. And then once we came up with our plan for the campaign, then we pulled in a broad coalition and that included thought leaders, anyone with a stakeholder interest in our community, uh, you know, and both sides of the aisle. And then that group works together as a team, uh, which you were on, to help help pass that measure and that resolution. But but this is a long process. So I think right now, uh, and I think to Jim's, uh, Councilmember Reed's point is is hearing back from the city on that piece. And and I was wondering too when the uh, I was here when. A poll when the timing for a poll would be, you know, what would be the, the appropriate timing and, and that information as well. Um, I'm thinking about the comments about um, updating numbers, and you know, whenever we update them, it's a, we're always going to need to. Update. There's always it's always changing. We're already estimating what's going to happen not just next year but the years after that. So I recognize you can always make better numbers. The best numbers we have are the best. But you know, I'm comfortable myself with, with, you know, using the best numbers we have, recognizing we'll continue to refine them as as we go ahead. Um, and so I, maybe we can all at least agree on let's hear back from the city manager 
about the options, and then we can maybe talk a little bit more about how we would proceed, whether we update the budget or whatever else. Whatever we do, I know you'd be updating numbers anyway, like we have right. tonight, but uh, so those are my thoughts. So I want to help you transition, because we have a couple of other goal areas to talk about, but I will return with this topic with a work plan, and then we'll have another discussion about the work plan, and then we will start getting into prioritization and more details about polling um, at that time. I think, I think I heard what everybody wants to do. I think I have enough information at this point uh, to move forward. And Councilmember Reed, we can um, agendize uh, your question on the next um, meeting. And so we'll take care of that process to get whatever authority I need. Okay, as a part of the work plan. Okay. okay. And we move ahead to uh, encourage business development and expand its economic base. Of course, this has to do with general plan and uh, town center, um, some big, uh, big projects that we've been dealing with and will continue to. So, um, comments from council? Did you want to say anything? Um, sure. So, on the general plan update, I think that has, we've done an update to you on that path forward. I think that's pretty clear. Um, and you will have representatives from the council on that committee that will provide you updates as well as council. I think that is a definite carryover for you to consider. And the development of the town center, of course, is a continuation. And what I would um, maybe encourage council to give you some direction is how you would like to see um, me, staff, be more um, uh, supportive or partnering with the town center developers, how we can bring resources to the table to help facilitate uh, things forward for them, um, help peer review some of the things that they've put together, and just initially, this is a public-private partnership essentially, and so we do have resources in the budget to do that, and I would like to hear more from Council on how we can be a further help. That's what I, read. I, I would think you need to tell us what, what is, I, I, rather than us just kind of spitballing, here's how you can help, here's how you can help, you're going to be the one on the ground who's going to know what they need, what you can offer through Taylor and, and company, what we need to contract out for. So I've heard to, from different council members that there is a need for help up. Um, council members have given me a variety of um, options. I have my own that I've shared with council. Um, I will put out to you one option in place is to have an economic development strategist, which I've identified to provide some retail guidance both at a national state and local level uh, to do some market studies um, and kind of peer review what they've done um, so far. I have talked with the developers. They're very much interested in having any type of additional support um, and also um, using them to test whatever uh, economic models they have put in place and what, looking at what they haven't yet done um, and filling in those gaps. And then as well, using all that information and determining if there is an additional third party to bring in to provide some guidance on conceptual design work. And I think that's where you um, where you need the most probably support. So that's my summary. What I'm really looking for is whether there's consensus of council is, yes, please go forth and do that. And I want to make sure the body is in agreement on that approach. Yes, please go forth and do that. <laughs> I would be in favor of yes. seeing that happen. Vice Mayor. Thank you, Mayor. So uh, I think that's a terrific idea. Um, I, um, you know, the, the village, um, town, town center or whatever, you know, uh, Aptos Village, um, is a 11 and a half acre uh, project that is, you know, reaching its fruition. I mean, you, you have the residentials are pretty much built out, at least the first two, one or two phases. And so, um, I thought it might be a good idea to bring Doug Ross, who's part of the uh, town center team, along with one of the developers of, of Aptos Village, and we did a walk around there and to kind of not so much to open, um, you know, our um, uh, developers' eyes on what the possibilities, but just kind of expose them to to what some of those possibilities really are. What kind of stores are going in there? What kind of rents are being paid? Is it feasible to bring in, um, you know, this kind of store, that kind of store? What kind of leases uh, are working? Uh, are some of these um, retail uh, operations buying, you know, and actually are they leasing? And some of them are actually buying the space. They're 2,400 square feet, um, and you know, so 
it was a it was a it was a very good you know hour and a half where where um, I think some eyes were open um, because I think guiding uh, the you know right now we have a, a development team that you know looks quite frankly let's be honest looks at retail and and commercial as kind of a secondary thing. And in some ways, it probably has shifted from where it was 10 years ago because everybody who came in, you know, the last 10 developers, I'm sorry to say, have come in and said, you know, we're commercial, we're going to build this commercial, and oh, by the way, we're going to, uh, as a secondary motion, we're going to bring in a uh, retail, retail developer. These people are more residential and bringing on the, the commercial part of it. Um, but this, but that means that they have to be exposed and be realistic and be optimistic about what the opportunities are for commercial, both for office and uh, retail space. And it worked out pretty well because they went for it and they were going to do more collaboration and they got some really great ideas of who, who the actual tenants are going to be. And it's surprising what some of the tenants are. What is a sock shop of all things, right? Um, wow, who knew? Or one's a, I believe, a creamery uh, for ice cream and so forth. You can still do those things. And so I think the eyes were opened a little bit. So that might be, you might be able to do the very same thing by bringing in a third party and say, hey, these are possible. Now get to it. <laughs> so. I did forget to mention, too, that um, as you know, the town center isn't just about those 16 acres. It's the whole area and looking at what's happening with Sears and Kmart. It's what happen what's happening across the street at Safeway. And so um, the consultant that I have in mind, I'm also having them look at uh, what potential uses could go into the Kmart and whether that's you know, subdivided, but what is out there and what's possible. And also having him look and work with Bijal Patel with respect to our Marriott um, extended stay, whether we need to facilitate a partnership to get that off the ground, or whether it's a sale, but you have an entitled project that is um, worth quite a bit. So just to let you know that that approach is not just solely about the town center, but all of us, I think this was a Rand, your um, coined term of complementary uses um, around the town center and the city. So just wanted to add that. Any other comments? Yes. Um, I just wanted to say that uh, to, to Jenny's point, you know, the neighboring center, we have to be aware. I mean, one of our big tax draws right now is Kmart, and that's going away. I think the city's aware of that's going to happen at some point in the near future. We don't know what, what day, but it's one of those things we need to plan for and, and how that taps into our town center. Um, uh, so I, I, I'm really, like I said, I'm very much in favor of you bringing in someone to help. I don't think we have the staff or resources or even the right specific person within our city that can help that developer. So um, I think it's a great idea. So. Great, thank you. I do as well. <clears throat> okay. Um, have we talked enough about this section? Yeah. Uh, yes, I, I have enough. Do we want to talk anything about branding in, in this section? Yes, definitely. Do. Yeah, sure. I, I I'd be happy to add to that. So. I think, um, <clears throat> you know, one of the things that, that we, um, I, I've often heard uh, uh, Councilmember Reed say, you know, one of the things that we need is a there there, and part of having a there there is uh, a, a brand for our city, and one of the things we don't have right now, you know, when I, like, when I go out and I'm at the League of Cities, oh, you're from Scotts Valley, well, where's that? You know, what is that? Oh, it's, well, it's near this. It's near, and you're, and you're describing it in a way that people don't know, and, and we need to be on the map. And the way you're on a map, um, you want to be on a map in a positive way. And I think we have just this amazing uh, resource here, and the beauty of our community, our hills, our trails, uh, nearby mountain biking, uh, nearby road biking, nearby, you know, all these things that we have to offer as a community. We have the redwoods, we have hiking, we have, um, the list goes on and on. We're 10 minutes from the beach, but people don't necessarily think about coming to stay here and making this their destination. Uh, so uh, we have to kind of change that thinking, but the way you do that is through a branding exercise. And um, this does not happen overnight. It's like, okay, hey, we're just going to call ourselves the city that is X. And suddenly people are like, oh, it's the city that's X. And, you know, this is a, this is a five, ten year plan to get people to recognize uh, why they should come to Scotts Valley. We have some amazing resources. The 1440 is incredible. 
Uh, it's part of our destination here. It's, and, and they are spending millions of dollars to brand uh, their center, uh, but that also puts Scotts Valley on the map. And so what do those people see when they come back to town? Um, how do we reach out to them and let them know they want to come back here for other things that we offer? Um, and I think that's one of the things that we can do as a city and, and how we can kind of, I think, hit on the ecotourism uh, uh, vibe that we have going already. Um, but how do we brand that and, and how can the city do that? Well, we don't have necessarily someone in branding here. Is that something you want to think about or talk about? Um, I, I think it should be considered. I was on the uh, a committee with the chamber a while back and we had started working on that and trying to come up with, uh, and it, it was funny because when Jenny came here and created her webpage and, and gave us the, the gateway to, you know, gave us this title, in fact I'm just trying to remember exactly what it is, Gateway to, gateway to the Santa Cruz Mountains. Yeah. Um, it was funny because there were people that were all over the board and we had a really hard time coming up with a, a consensus. To the point that the committee said, well, we, one of the committee members said, we should put it to a vote of people. And went, Never mind. <laughs> <laughs> Never mind. We'll put this, we'll hold this. Um, but it was something that there was um, one of the members was with Gorilla. That, that's what she did. And it was really, I think, a topic that we all, I mean, years ago it was where Sands Village. Well, no one knows Sands Village anymore. But... Um, it was a topic that we had trouble getting consensus on, and, and it is something that um, the experts at the time, through the uh, Santa Cruz Visitors Bureau and through uh, the person from this with this background, felt would be important. So I think you're right on it. Just uh, I think it's something we need to do from here and not try to coordinate with too many other groups because it was hard to come up with a consensus and a direction. So, Manager, can you remind me? We revised the economic development policy. Does it touch on this? It does. It, um, there's a lot of support for what Councilmember Tim is um, alluding to in terms of the need or lack thereof of branding and marketing. And one of the first steps is really, um, you know, the city needs an identity. Part of the town center was kind of the effort of creating that sense of place and belonging. And so also what's really important is getting this kind of process underway is that it really um, shapes and guides your thinking in terms of capital projects. Uh, because they all come into play and the council has indirectly done a lot of this already through um, making um, you know grants with for our Glenwood widening for uh, the parking at Shugart for the trails at Glenwood the intersection improvements the bike lanes on um, on Navarra and on Glen Canyon I mean you're all starting to put this kind of piece of the puzzle together and so we just need someone to come help us glue it and figure out kind of what do we call this. And we have to capitalize on those assets like the bicycles and 1440 and all of that. We just need someone to help kind of carve that path forward of how we put it all together. So I think we've really done a lot of legwork, um, but it also will help inform your, your future policy decisions once you kind of know what that identity is. So as you can see, I'm like all for it, but I need you guys to tell me if you want me to do it. So. So um, I agree with everything Derek said. He's right on. And I hear Donna's point about how we, uh, this is a topic that every, it's like uh, everybody's got an opinion on this. And there's no limit of number to the number of people who want to get involved in marketing us and we should do this and we should do that. And I agree, we don't want to lose control of the process. We need to be the ones driving it. At the same time, there's a lot of work that's already being done that we don't necessarily have to cooperate with, but we need to at least be aware of and if and, and try to channel in a direction that, you know, instead of us having to paint the fence ourselves, we're going to be able to get them to paint it for us, right? So branding costs money, right? The branding professionals we don't have, and the only way to get them is to spend money we don't have. But there are hoteliers in town that are talking about tourism business improvement districts taxing themselves to start to fund some of these areas to promote people who are going to stay and do activities here in this part of Santa Cruz County rather than going to the beach. So I agree completely. We don't want to lose control at the same time. How, what's, the, what's the right amount to, to explore and engage with other people and see what they're doing and see what we like and 
encourage what we don't like, tweak and try and get to modify things that we do. So there's an outreach component here without the city ceding control, I, I, I think is what the sweet spot we'd probably all like to hit. Yeah. Joe, do you have any specific ideas of how we would how we would get there uh, without not seating control? Um, and may, I, I don't know. Maybe in, could we start maybe in small ways before we define it, but just talk more about our our, our benefits, our community, as you know, whether it's the budget or whether it's the website or whether it's social media or whatever it is. I don't have a specific answer for you right now, but I can tell you that I'm working on it. And so I'll probably be more prepared to maybe come back with the work plan and give you a little bit more detail as I um, collect my thoughts and answers. I do have feelers out there on um, a suggested approach, but just not ready for with all the details yet. So this is very helpful feedback for all the council, though. And, yes. and I have um, the contact of the CEO from the uh, branding company who lives here as a friend and has said that uh, she would be willing to offer services as well, just be an extra resource, so I can plug you in with that. Okay, shall we move on? Um, yes. Well, you know, I, I uh, no, I'll, I'll say it. Okay. No problem, if you have something more Well, I, I just, I, the, the other thing they brought up at the, um, at the uh, League of Cities was this idea that they're going to be, you know, the state has now allowed people to deliver marijuana within our borders, right? So we're now suddenly open for business as a city for marijuana. Um, but we have restrictions on it. I don't know whether we want to explore as a city. They're recommending to cities, you know, look at how you're going to tax it. And um, uh, we've taken a, a hands-off approach. Uh, but I don't, they're now saying we should reconsider that because it's coming here whether we like it or not. So I, I, I don't know whether we want to have that discussion, but uh, I throw that out there as something to talk about. It, it, was something that, it was something that I noticed too, and it actually is mentioned to our city manager. I mean, um, we had um, disallowed dispensaries, but allowed discreet medical marijuana delivery, but that's been taken out of our hands. What we need to realize with that is there's going to be an impact on our police services, and with that, there will be cost to the city. There, it, there's, you know, there's a real reason to be able to say, if the state is saying we have no control, then we need to cover our costs associated with uh, this, because there will be an increase in robberies and burglaries and those things. It just We've seen that already in areas that there are dispensaries. So I think it's an appropriate discussion. I was under the impression that there were issues with taxing delivery services in general. So, and it sounds like we at California Cities thinks that it's an option. No, uh, the, you cannot tax the delivery right. coming here. It is a question of do we revise rules to, right. like, if, if it's going to be delivered, well, the, the you know doors already open. Do we now allow services within our city limits? Oh, that's so because you're you're not going to have if, if people are delivering to our city, yeah. we're, that revenue is going to whatever city it's being delivered from. Not Scott's so It's unlike unless it's coming from Washington, I guess, and then it's you know if it's being delivered through Amazon, that might be something else, right? <laughs> but other than that, that that hasn't happened yet. So uh, uh, for now, that would be the. Okay. Yeah, and I and I would agree that's an issue, and yet I also think about our youth and the right. and all that. So, oh, Council Member Reed. No, I, I was just going to weigh in that I, I didn't think we had the authority to tax deliveries, and I, I hear the argument that if basically if deliveries are bringing it here, whether we want it or not, do we need to consider it? I, I'm guessing deliveries are still a relatively small component of the overall purchase, but that's a guess. That's an uninformed guess, uh, and we should probably have some data for that. The other thing is. This, maybe this is done, maybe it's too messy to do this as part of the revenue option discussion, but the more I, the, the, the work that I've done looking at how much we can actually bring in 
on taxing marijuana if if we're not if it's not being grown here if we just have businesses that deal in it the it, it's not a cash cow um, but that's based on discussions with other agencies probably only you know six eight hours worth of work so we probably should have I think it's certainly worth reconsidering I'm, I'm not a, a, a afraid of that at all I, I, I don't know I'd leave it up to I don't know if council thinks or what you think. I don't know if that's done as part of the budget process or separate. Um, but yeah, it, it, I was, the point I was going to bring up is I think the only thing we can do is revisit the whole notion of our current ban, which I'm not unhappy. I'm, I'm very comfortable with the ban that we have. and But at the same time, I'm, I'm happy to look at the data and, and the arguments for why we should change that. We can certainly add that to um, the list and try to um, begin some uh, data with our neighbors and find out, kind of basically order of magnitude whether it's worth it or not from a financial perspective. I would agree that the storefronts are probably not as lucrative as potentially the cultivation and whatnot, um, and that you know the council would also have to weigh in on just how many stores would you even allow. So. And it sounds like we'd be talking about a tax on a fee, which would require uh, a vote of people. What, what guidance do you need from us? I think that's adequate. Okay, any other comments? Or shall we move on? To implement operational initiatives to enhance city services. To comments? So we will probably be able to come to you as a part of the budget process with our initial kind of assessment and what we've found and what we're recommending as maybe a first step. Of course, um, you know, there will be a price tag associated with this, so we need to do kind of a cost-benefit analysis of part of that um, discussion. But I would recommend that we would keep this on for at least the current year, and um, we could roll it over if we needed to if we're still having the discussion. But I think uh, the work has been done for the most part for the current fiscal year, so we are kind of got ourselves covered. If council wants to um, implement maybe one of our recommendations, then that could be something that could stay on here. And so we could modify this as necessary when this comes forward, if you'd like. Um, but if there are other um, operational initiatives that you'd like us to look at, um, I don't have any immediate recommendations in terms of waiting for the results of this assessment and getting direction from council, which should come as a part of the budget development process. I have one I'd like to, to raise. I want to be careful because um, it's so important that we deal with some of our major issues this year, and we have some, some staffing issues, I know. Um, but when I see the policy guidelines about council standing and project-specific committees for increased effectiveness and transparency, I'm thinking also about our commissions. Um, but I want to be careful because uh, I, don't, I want staff to stay focused on our major issues. So part of my question is I'm not sure how much capacity of staff it would take for us to, to look at our commissions. Um, and uh, if this were the will of the council, I'm not sure how other council members feel, but you know, talking about things like uh, the need, purpose, uh, goal setting uh, for, our, for our committees. Um, do we set their goals? Do they set theirs? Um, I know in some cases it's, it's clear, some cases it isn't really clear to me. And communication in particular, how we have communication between commissions and, and the council, should we have joint meetings? Now that's, a, that's an impact on us, but it would be one way to, um, to have a, more of a conversation. So I guess I'd like to, to look at the feasibility of, could we make our commissions more, more meaningful, more useful? Um, do we have the right number of commissions? Um, and I'm not sure how the council members feel about this, but, um, but if we have the capacity to look at that in the context of everything else, that's something I'm interested in if, if council members were also interested to others. Any thoughts? So I'd be fine taking that up. I would like us to also assess the other end of that pendulum, which is, our, do we, given the, as the vice, or as the mayor, forgive me, uh, mentioned with our staff constraints, are we already investing a lot of staff time that we really don't have? in groups, very well-meaning people who are wonderfully intelligent and smart, but we're not using, utilizing their time properly and maybe we're not using staff time because there's just, 
again, this is a small city. There are a lot of things that we can do ourselves. And, and, and so I'm, I'm fine studying that, but I'd like real serious consideration to be given to the other side of that equation. Right, we do have some um, recommendations uh, in terms of building capacity and efficiencies for the council to consider. So I think it's a great topic from my perspective. And again, it's all about priorities. If there are two things you'd like us to look at, uh, we'll bring back um, a, a smaller work plan with respect to this. Um, keep in mind that you're going to have a brand new planning commission. So if you want to do some type of joint meeting or something, you might want to prioritize and narrow it down to what is important. But we'll certainly put something together for you to consider. Um, I think it's a great suggestion. Yeah, I, I thank Catherine Reed for bringing that up because that was I didn't I didn't say that clearly, but that was part of my thought process. You know, while it may take some resources to do some of this, at the same time, could we be a lot more efficient? So I was thinking exactly that. <laughs> thank you. And that was my thought too. Is we have some commissions we've had trouble filling or keeping filled and we may need to look at what's more efficient. Okay, so I've heard um, you know, evaluation of the commission's um, purpose, efficiency, what do we really need, capacity, building opportunities, uh, and then also I think we could keep on the technology piece and see how that evolves because that's something definitely work, you know, smarter, not harder. Um, and we'll definitely have some recommendations with respect to that for you uh, in the next coming months. So did I summarize that appropriately? Yes, I was thinking the communication piece too, but maybe that's wrapped in there also, just efficient communications. Yes, and I think that is certainly an ongoing piece and will continue to evolve. Should we move on to the next section? Maintain quality of life for residents. So for this one, uh, we certainly have a few things that will continue. Um, I know that the chief is continuing to work on the body cameras, and so that will carry over for the next year. Uh, where I really would need some help is with respect to housing affordability um, and then the building design standards, as you know, because the GPAC is going to be addressing areas that would directly relate to that. And then uh, we can continue to keep uh, Glenwood open space on there because we will be working on the East Trails. And then um, code enforcement is also another um, question mark, whether you would like that at least listed on your uh, maintain quality of life residence goal. Uh, just one point for the council to consider. So I was the main person, I think it's fair to say, pushing the building uh, review and design standards last year. Um, since we were not able to make uh, progress on that, um, I'm, it's, uh, it was important to me last year. It is when I was mayor. It's less important to me now. So if we can, um, if people want to scrub this, we can. I agree with the point city manager raised that a lot of this could be addressed potentially through the GPAC. So uh, if that's an opportunity to cut and people want to do that, that's fine. I still think there's val there's validity if we go ahead with that, whether it's done through staff or a consultant. But I just want to throw that out there. Comments. Um, I, I, I see some value in this, but, but I, it does seem that we haven't been through the, I haven't been through the general plan process yet, but it sounds like we will be touching on this to some extent. So I don't know if there's something we do as part of the general plan process that would pick some of this up. Your, your GBAC committee will be dealing with issues that directly relate to this, so they could be coming up with recommendations for council consideration as a part of the update process. So that could come before you. Um, they could also identify other issues that may take additional resources. So one way or another, this topic's going to rear its head with you. Um, and also, if there's things that are coming up in between them that have budget implications that the council would like us to look at in tandem, we can certainly bring those recommendations forward to you as part of the budget development process. So the question is whether this is just one of those goals that you know, you want out in the forefront, that's super important, um, but it's not going to necessarily get lost because it will be addressed as a part of the GPAC process. Now, I'm, I'm uh, thinking about design. I when I look around town and I know I, that's where I drive. I know the buildings were built at different points in time with different, but I, I, you know, I would love to see us, without being too prescriptive, have a way of, of having more design standards uh, reasonable design standards. Um, so I, I'd like to see us go in that direction. Yeah, yeah and, it, and I'm not saying pull it off. The example that I used when I brought this up goes back to a project we approved several years ago where 
the developer met the parking standards that we called for at the same time the chief of police and the lieutenant were basically saying we don't recommend you approve this project because we think it's under par. And so, you know, again, to me that's a classic example of why we need to do a, a level set of, and see, I don't think, Jenny, that, that that's an issue that's going to be answered by the GPAC. I could be wrong. But just where are areas where, where our, our standards are out of whack with recent experience and, you know, comparisons to other cities and what do they do and what are best practices. So that's, that's what I was getting at, but feel free. I, I think Taylor might be able to further uh, elaborate, but if, you know, you have the GPAC looking at uh, the 50-50 past practice and things like that, that there are implications there um, that will affect parking. So it could, it could potentially come up when we have faced discussions like that um, with respect to specific projects that come before this council. Um, but again, you know, it's at the direction of the council what, what you'd like to do and see as a goal. Yeah, so it could come up at the same time. I'd love it if we never had a situation again where the developer says, hey, I did what you told me to do, and the chief of police says, don't approve this, it's a bad idea. So again, that's the most extreme example. But how do we make sure, and it seems to be the only way you, you figure out what the answer to that question and any other rough edges like that is if, is if somebody delves into it. I recognize this is time and money that is a challenge for us, so again, I don't, I'm, I'm kind of torn because, uh, because resources are, are so constrained. Well, another area is Blue Bonnet. <clears throat> As Metro said, we've, you know, that's, I think we're learning from some of these that the developer tells us it'll work and, you know, years later we're struggling with people overflow parking in Metro. And so some of it sounds like we may be able to work with, we're learning, so we may be able to focus more and, and look at some of these projects that created issues later, so, as part of the GPAC. <coughs> Yes, Vice Mayor. So, um, you know, maintain quality of life for residents is a pretty big banner. Um, and we've distilled it down to like seven or eight different checkpoints here. Could probably do like 15 or 20. Um, I recognize that we can't be, it, you can't have an exhaustive list or whatever. I think recreation is a big part of it. Um, so maybe just keep that in the, at least in the background or at least uh, as a, topic of discussion, you know, how we need, because recreation, both for team sports and just, you know, uh, mothers being able to go to uh, the playground and play and have fun with their kids, and fathers for that matter, um, is important. And it's important in the mind of people, so maintaining that is something that we want to, um, you know, not, not uh, endanger in any, in, in any way. So. Um, I might just put that in, at least in parentheses. Councilman Tim. Um, the other thing I would recommend we, and I don't know if this is the appropriate place for it, but um, there, is, there are dollars now at the state level for uh, fuel clearing and fire prevention, mm -hmm. and I think that's a critical thing for our city. Um, and I know that, you know, if, by way of example, uh, next to our neighborhood, you have the, the Granite Creek open space there. And um, one of the neighbors after the Napa fire came to our HOA board and said, hey, we, how can we make sure that doesn't happen here? And so we collaborated with uh, the then um, uh, community development director along with uh, Cal Fire and uh, the fire department to have a crew come in to clear all the low-lying brush. And that's what ladders and creates the fire in the upper canopy when you see these big wipeouts. And so that was done, but there wasn't, you know, that was city property. Um, there wasn't kind of an ongoing maintenance plan, but there's actually big dollars coming from the state right now to prevent that. So I think it would be good if, if the city had direction to work with you. I and mean, they're probably already doing this, but, but if it's one of our directives that we think that's important and something we want to prevent. But, you know, excuse me, that's an interesting um, topic of discussion. I mean, even in uh, the suburbs of the vineyards, you know, our HOA president has actually brought in our fire department and also Cal Fire to explore, you know, what the dangers are of some of the trees, you know, in the vineyards. Now, it's, 
when you think about it, that's that's it's always been considered safe, but but the um, Santa Rosa fire taught us that you know sometimes nothing's safe when the, this conflagration of you know uh, monstrous flames and two thousand degrees and so forth. Um, and one of the things that you know the, I think our HOA president brought up is you know we have a we have on our we have on I guess the books that if you you know cut down a tree you have to replace it with you know two or something I don't know what what, what it is Taylor but it's uh, you have to replace sometimes that you know trees can be both friends and foe so we might want to consider you know what we do with that um, kind of ordinance of and what kind of trees I mean we. You know, it's interesting, we talked about the destruction of a sidewalk because of roots, but, but we, we might have to look at the destruction of a community based on canopies of trees and how big they can get and how destructive they can be under the wrong circumstances. So it's something to perhaps think about. I like the idea of just looking at the, do we really need to have a, if it's two trees for one, but I've seen photographs, aerial photographs of Scotts Valley from long ago and there were less than half as many trees from the air. And I love trees and I want to protect trees, but I'm not sure I understand the concept of replacing one with two, and I'm sure there's a, a goal behind that, a good goal. And sometimes the trees are small, you have a big tree, and maybe that's part of it. Um, but I, I would like to look at that. It sounds like an easy thing to look at, um, unless there's something I don't, don't know about. But would it be easy to, to come up with a rule about that, or do you have to look at it more closely? The Planning Commission could probably give us some direction. Mm -hmm. uh, back to uh, Councilmember Reed's comments about the design guidelines. I don't think we ever clearly said whether or not we wanted that to still be in here. I'd like to keep it in. It, you know, Jenny, we're giving, we're, uh, we're made, I don't know if our appetite, our eyes are getting bigger than our stomach here, mm -hmm. and, and your stomach's turning over because we're, we're throwing new things at you. Uh, again, to me, this would be, I'd like to see us make progress on it, but if if we're loading you up with a lot of stuff and you're you're not able to figure out where the resources are going to come from this and we need to start cutting, I would be willing to cut it at the same time if we don't have to cut it, I think it's important and we should we should do something on it. So to follow up on that, I would suggest it might say that yes, it's on the list, but please tell us if things the other projects take too too much time and you can't get to that, then just come back and, and, and let us know that so we're aware. Prioritize or something. Um, absolutely. So we can do that, and I also think um, we can do some check-ins too. If the you know if the GPAC's not even touching on that in the way that we thought, then that really kind of gives us more clear direction on looking at, at that more deeply. Um, I do need us to kind of um, whittle down what we want to do with trees and wildfire, and some of what I hear um, uh, Council Member Ten talking about is an interagency collaboration. Uh, with the fire district, with Cal Fire, so this is a little bit bigger of an animal, not to say it's not important. I've already started conversations with Chief Kovacs um, on that. I do think that it is a very a big topic of discussion in the community. We are surrounded by this, um, so you know, my recommendation to you is that you would want to probably keep something on this priority list so that we can start chipping away at it. It may not happen in a year, but we should start planting seeds on how we can work towards that goal, um, I, I really would need to be talking to some of the major stakeholders to better understand how, um, what leverage we have and how we can work together and what uh, suggested goals um, that I could bring back in a work plan for you. I do have a conversation scheduled next Monday with Chief, so I think I can, from what I heard, I think I could put something together for your consideration when I bring this back to you. Um, City Manager, would that be a proper topic for the, what's it called, the interagency Advisory subcommittee is is that just about water or is that about other issues like this? So that was that was developed more about development activity. Um, I don't know if that's the venue that you want to maybe bring broach that. I, I would think Jenny, you've got great relations with all with all your peers with all the agencies. I would I would think you handle that through your sure. That would be great. That would be my gut reaction. It might be something though with city select that that you know that that. Could be discussed in the mayor's 
you know, yeah. among all the jurisdictions. Yeah. There are conversations that are being had about having an interagency, interjurisdictional meeting on this wildfire topic that um, I'm kind of betting through. Uh, community members are bringing it up. So there, it, it has taken off. So um, let, why don't you let me kind of digest this, bring some points back to you, and then we can kind of further refine that at um, maybe the meeting on the 6th, if that works for council. But Derek's point was that there's money available, too. So yes, and what I need to understand is whether we are eligible for that money. We do not have a fire department, and so whether um, it has to be through a fire agency or whether there's a collaborative uh, grant with all of us that we can get that money. So you asked us about trees and whether what you expected, what we would expect you to do on that. Um, it's not a burning, burning issue for me. <laughs> no pun intended. But I know, Vice um, Mayor, did you have thoughts about how important that is? Lower priority. I think generally, just um, you know, with all these things, I think where it's going to come to is got a lot of issues here. At some point, we, we just have to trust your ability to prioritize and uh, you know what bubbles to the top, um, and just keep us informed. And so, if, if if a council member thinks that well, maybe this needs a little bit more consideration, then we can correct you then. But until then, I mean, we have we, we discussed a lot tonight, and I think it, you have to kind of synthesize in your mind, you know, and think about it. Uh, you know, what's the best way to move forward, and then let us know. Um, you asked for feedback earlier about the afford affordability, housing affordability, and I know that's an area we're struggling with staff right now because we have some staff turnover, and so it's likely we won't have a lot of resources this year to, to uh, approach some of those issues that were raised last, last year with the, uh, with the committee. Um, so um, I, that's a very, very important topic. So I'm about to leave it on here but recognize that um, there's only so much we can do. One thing, I was talking to Habitat for Humanity yesterday, and they, they would love to talk with us about some programs that may not necessarily involve city staff, but ways of encouraging people to work through them uh, to, you know, build a granny unit or whatever. And, and um, so I'd like to hear what they have to say, but I bring that up in the context, it may not have a direct impact on staff, so maybe something like that would be, uh, would fit into this as a discussion point more easily. So would you like to leave that on and says as it's feasible, or would you like to have that off? I would, I would say as feasible, but I, but I, as we're hearing your plate is full. What, what's the? I, I would just, like it to go away. You would, okay. Yes. Well, you know we have some serious. <laughs> and I mean that in the most sincere way. I know you do. <laughs> um, Well, let's, and Sorry, we needed some comic relief. It's getting late. <laughs> so maybe, maybe we do take it away, but maybe we there's still a role for the affordable housing committee, certainly as projects. Yes, there always will be. And maybe still a discussion place for things that could bubble up, specific ideas. So even if this weren't on the list, we still may have an opportunity to discuss it. Oh, absolutely. What others think about that? I know it's it's a the community here is about affordable housing. I know that. Does any other council member have any input on that? I know I had my own contributions last year to what the committee could consider that we weren't able to get to, so. Um, okay. But I know we can only do so much. Yes, that's correct. If there are if there are opportunities, though, um, like Habitat for Humanity that come up that um, we think, you know, the, the investment is worthwhile because mm -hmm. there's a huge benefit, then, of course, we want to bring that to your attention. And likewise, you would bring that to ours. I guess I'd love it if I thought we had the capacity, but I don't think we have the capacity. Anybody object to us taking that off? All right. Okay, well, I think I have enough direction to put together a draft work plan um, for your consideration for the next meeting. Um, does the public have any comments about this? Okay, then, okay, then we'll move on to um, item two. 2019 Interjurisdictional Committee, Standing Local Committee, and Project Specific Subcommittee Appointments. 
Uh, so, Mayor, just to keep this very brief, um, as you know, each year the mayor brings forward a recommendation and has a discussion about council member appointments to interjurisdictional committees, standing local committees, and project specific. Uh, we will be doing that again. Standing local committees, as you know, are subject to the Brown Act and the project specific committees because uh, they meet infrequently and are of a limited duration. They usually have an explicit purpose, um, are not subject to the Brown Act. I would um, want to encourage council that. If you feel that there is a need for a subcommittee um, and the need is immediate, then you would want to establish that tonight. If you don't, then we can establish it when the time arises. They are always there for you, uh, but you do not have to make appointments to a subcommittee that is not necessarily in need at the moment. Um, so with that, I would like to turn this discussion over to the mayor. Thank you. Um, so I did meet Honoring the Brown Act, I met individually or talked individually on the phone in some cases with each council member and, and got a feel for what they wanted to do, uh, what they might be persuaded to do, um, or what they didn't want to do. So I tried to take that into consideration and I did not get back to all council members with any definitive, but I put that, all that together and come up with some ideas and recommendations, trying to honor the past um, process here of honoring the expertise and continuity of those who were serving on existing committees, also looking for new opportunities, um, and in particular because um, former council member Aguilar left the council, and we have, uh, now we have council member Tim here, that created some new opportunities uh, for uh, mixing it up, certainly always changing uh, who would be on some of the subcommittees. Um, so, uh, here we go, I would say that uh, in particular, I've got I'm an alternate on a bunch of things, so if anybody wants to uh, be the alternate instead of me for most of these, I, I'm certainly open to that. Before you go too far, yes. I'm not sure I told you that I would take the Arts Council back if you wanted me to. I will yeah, do that one. Okay. That one I think I had got rid of, but I would take it back since I know you're taking several things on. I'm not that sure we, we, I don't think we talked about that one. It's so. the second one after I made. Oh, there it is. Thank you. Um, okay. Thank you. So we'll, we'll um, I'll start at the top there. Okay, just to keep I just was saving you that one. Thank you. No, and it was second. Any other ones we didn't talk about? <laughs> okay, so we'll start at the top with AMBAG. Um, and during the past year, uh, former council member Aguilar was uh, represented to AMBAG, and I was the alternate. I did go to one meeting. Um, I've been talking to council member Tim, and he seemed to have an interest in being our representative in AMBAG, and I would be willing to to still be the alternate to that, unless someone else had an interest. Um, so, any thoughts about that? Um, anybody? Okay. Um, moving on now to the Arts Council. So, hearing that, I would suggest that uh, Council Member Lynn to be our representative. And I, and I uh, guess you have been in the past, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, I had, and it didn't have an alternate before. You did not? No. Oh, are you okay with not having an alternate? I'm okay with it. Okay, I've done I, it for about eight years, probably ten years, so I've I'm okay, uh, and I did not fill in as an alternation on the names here. Yeah, so. I know. Um, moving on to city select city selection committee, um, that would uh, be the mayor vice mayor, and that's a, that is a, a meeting uh, of the mayors each month from uh, I think it's each month from all the cities in the in the county, and the CAO sits in, in that meeting as well, the county administrative officer. Um, so we would leave that one mayor vice mayor. Unless, yeah, okay. Um, city school district joint subcommittee. Uh, we've had council uh, member Reed and Vice Mayor Johnson uh, on this, and I know they both have a strong interest in in continuing on that. Mayor, yes. I, I, it's not that I I so much had a change of heart, but I think as much experience as um, Derek has with the school district and so forth. And, so forth. I think it'd be better if uh, I turned that over to him. I was thinking similarly, uh, but I wanted okay. to respect that. Yeah. And I know he told me he has a strong interest in that. I have a strong interest as well, but I would agree that um, Councilmember Tim is, is would be great on this committee because you have such a great working relationship with the school district already. Be my pleasure. So it'd be Reed and Tim. Yes. Yeah. That sound okay? That's great. <coughs> Good. Are the staffs take, taking note of all these? Okay, great. Let's make sure. Um, moving on to the Criminal Justice Council, and of course, Councilmember Wind has been uh, actively involved 
on the council and also serving on their executive committee and they used to have a strong interest, I know. And we're in the midst of some things that I yeah. wouldn't want to see it change right now. I've been listed as an alternate, but I don't know, is there a place for an alternate on there? Um, if, yeah, if I happen to attend, I just never miss one. Either. Yeah, I know you don't. You're, yeah. you're, you're, you're there, so. <laughs> but okay. you can certainly attend, I'll just say, if okay. you chose to. Okay, and I'm, okay, I'm okay with, with staying as an alternate on that, unless someone else were interested. Um, okay, then. Moving on to the Scottsdale General Plan Advisory Committee. So uh, when the council um, set this up last year, um, we appointed the mayor and vice mayor, um, although it says Johnson slash Reed, and they're most of the way through this, um, and it's, they're doing a good job, and it's uh, an important subcommittee, you know, they're, they're part of a larger committee from the community, and I think continuity is, is really important here. Uh, I know we also have had uh, Councilmember Tim in a different role as the chair of the planning commission sitting on that. Uh, so he certainly has a stake in it as well, but to me it makes sense to keep the, the two existing council members that are on that. Um, well, I, I think, um, again, um, it's almost a, certainly one of, uh, among the three, two of us should be on that and I think mm -hmm. I think moving forward I think uh, Derek has expertise in terms of um, I mean there's really only two more meetings am I right Taylor essentially two two or three uh, no there'll be a series of meetings um, Still more probably, so. yeah, probably two or three regarding transportation <coughs> and then probably two regarding land use and then there'll be a, some final hearings but I think the bulk of the work has been done but there'll be some key decisions coming up in the, in the spring here you know, I'm willing to, to uh, hand it again. I don't want to put too much on your plate there, but if you're willing to kind of do that. I, I can handle it, yeah. Okay. Good. I, I think that would be a good cross-section of, um, you know, both new and old. And um, getting rid of the old, I mean that in many ways. <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> you know, you still call the media, they're old. Yes. <laughs> experience. Yeah, experience. So. I think that, that, that would be a good trade-off. Okay, now we haven't got through all of this, so there, there are other ones with uh, Tim's name on them, but we'll get to them and talk about them as well as their place. So, um, are, is there something else you want to pick up since you're... Um, yeah, I might... I might uh, as we go down the list. So we'll go down the list, okay. Um, let's see. So next we have the Hazardous Materials Advisory Commission, and we've relied upon Ron Whittle from the fire district to... Well, that will I understand he would still be there to do that, okay. Highway 70 Access Management Plan Project Development Team. There's a, a mouthful. Um, I believe that is complete because they did they did come up with a plan. It's been out there a couple of years. Yeah, so I don't, that was finished, right? Yeah. The plan was well. They still have some projects. I understand they might be following up on, but the plan itself is done. So I yeah. believe this team this uh, would go with go away. Interagency Advisory Subcommittee, which covers water, school, fire, and city on development issues, as the city manager mentioned earlier. Um, we've had the mayor on that, and uh, the alternate was uh, council member, former council member Aguilar. Um, so I would be willing to sit on that as mayor, and, and I believe that uh, council member Reed would be fine with being the alternate. Does this work for everybody? LAFCO, um, Councilmember Lynn has had that seat. Um, Scotts Valley is, we rotate this seat with other um, other agencies, so we will not, we will no longer be on LAFCO for this coming year. Well, no, it'll be June, I'll be, through, I mean, through May, so it'll be June. I'll be there oh, until then. I misunderstood that. Yeah, it, okay. I will be terming out, but it will be after the May meeting. So. Oh, okay. So then, are you okay with staying on as, as okay? I misunderstood that. I can see another column being at like expiration or something. Like that. It's, it's still close. Okay. League of California Cities, uh, Councilman Aguilar was on this one, former Councilman Aguilar, and of course um, Councilman Tim has, has obviously been already involved with the League of California Cities and has expressed an interest to to uh, represent us with the League, so um, that's how it applied to everybody. Great. I agree. The only thing I would add there, uh, just do we have the ability to name an alternate to that? It, like I, I know, um, 
You can for when you do the voting delegates, um, but you certainly could do it this, the League of California Cities, unless you're on some type of policy committee or something like that, um, you probably don't need an alternate, but they're usually going to the, um, the division management meetings and you'll have guest speakers, so, and any council member actually could go to that. Okay, good. So the only reason I brought it up is there have been times where, you know, somebody's attending regularly, but then something comes up, a business trip, somebody's sick, and all of a sudden they can't go, and it's a choice, or it's a choice, do I go and get everybody sick with a 100 degree fever, or to make sure our city isn't represented? So I guess just a question for us to consider, um, you know, to what extent should we name some of these al some alternates, especially to something like this that might involve some, uh, some travel on occasion? So it sounds like the only absolute responsibility is voting at the week uh, yes, conference. That, that's correct. Otherwise, everything is actually open to any right. council member. Right. So my point would, was there might be something that's important that we need to weigh in on, you know, especially given, as you noted earlier, city manager, that the governor's budget is proposing potential sticks as well as carrots for cities on, on housing and, and there's a lot of things that could come out of the legislature that could be really problematic for us. So just wanting to make sure that we've always got a strong voice there. So, so to Councilmember Reed's point, um, can I send a proxy if I were not unable to attend for some reason? That's okay, yeah, right? Absolutely. Yeah. Okay. So it doesn't have to be named ahead of time by the council? No. Fantastic. Sorry, Grace. And uh, would the, uh, there need to be council approval of that proxy or would council member Tim be able to do that? It, any, any council member could attend so it could be whoever you know is available to go can go and if a third party wanted to go hopefully there's not a browning tissue but they could attend as well so I think you have the discretion again it's just the voting delegate that is the big issue. Yeah. Okay, okay. Um, so moving on to the Library Advisory Commission, and Ellen Campos has served as well as a representative, but I understand um, there's a new person, um, Jim Landreth, Jim Landreth uh, who would uh, be representing us, so. Uh, Correct, yeah, that was a, sort of a, the choice that the Friends of the Library recommended that we proceed with. Good guy, very active. That's here. Yeah, I did see somebody here, okay. But she didn't stay. She came for that point. Okay. Okay. Um, then the next one here is the um, so two for Library Facilities Financing Authority and Library Joint Powers Authority Board. And here we have our city manager representing us. And so sounds like she would continue to. Uh, and then we have the Library Financing Authority, which has to do with, as I recall, the, the sales tax, the library sales tax that, that we all pay. Uh, and um, Councilman Reed has been on that. Yeah, that, that has to be elected. Yeah. yeah. And so I understand you would continue to be on Yeah, that would be great, Mayor. I'd appreciate that. And then the other thing is we, um, there was a meeting I wasn't going to be able to make and the council formally um, identified uh, Councilmember Johnson as my alternate to that. So. I went one time, yeah. Yeah, so, but, but I mean, we have to take action to name him as the, as the alternate. Yeah, so we need to so, add him. Yeah, that should be noted here. Okay. Yeah, assuming that the council wanted to keep him as alternate. And um, you're still fine with doing that, Council Member Johnson? I, I should say Vice Mayor Johnson. Okay. Um, okay, moving on to the Santa Cruz County Consolidated Oversight Board. Um, this is a county wide roll up of all the um, old RDAs. And we, we have three alternates in that there. It sounds like all three of us are okay with still being alternates myself. The vice mayor and Councilman Reed. Is that okay? okay. Um, then we have the Santa Cruz County Integrated Waste Management Local Task Force, which has representatives from um, the county and cities on recycling issues and uh, um, waste and so forth. And I have been the representative, and we've had various staff from Public Works be, uh, be the alternate. I'd like to swap that. I understand that that's happened in the past where staff would be the primary representative and I would be the alternate. Uh, I did find it, I enjoyed it, but I found it to be technical. They get into a lot of technical issues, and, and they're also good at explaining it to people like me, but, but there was a lot of technical talk. I had mentioned, I had previously been assigned, and I had Scott Hamby, I, and talking with him, it was so appropriate for him to be involved, so I shared that with the mayor, that it, 
I mean, it, it was good to have some awareness, but it's really appropriate to have staff level involved in those decisions that you're working with. So. I agree. Um, the, the, the only caveat I would add to that is there were times where um, uh, they did take up policy matters that were traditionally done by elected bodies, and it would be really important whoever the public works designee was that they had a sensitive antenna for when they needed to check in with the city manager or, or the mayor just on direction or if something was more a policy issue rather than a, a technical issue, which is most of the and Scott, Scott was really good about that on, on uh, some recycling issues and styrofoam and things so that he would notify me and kept me involved, and I'm sure. Um, you're correct, Councilmember Reed. Um, they do talk about policy issues. In fact, there was even discussion recently about, hey, do you think, how could this be more successful? Should we go city by city or something broader? And I said, well, with our city, we're probably more likely to follow something, to support something uh, much broader than just our community. Um, and typically, there's a review of all the pending legislation that's out there that someone may want to weigh in. So, um, and we do have a number of issues out there. Particularly, you've heard me talk about organic recycling for food waste, uh, possibly probably at our doorstep. So that's coming. So hopefully that. But I. So yeah, I would certainly step in as needed to uh, express um, whatever we need to do on the on that side of it. Okay. Um, next we have. The Santa Cruz County Regional Transportation Commission and um, the Vice Mayor, Vice Mayor Johnson has represented us there, and I know he still wants to, uh, he's indicated he still wants to keep doing that. Um, you heard him spoke, speak quite a bit tonight about the, the details of um, their latest. And Councilmember Lynn has been the alternate. I would like to be the alternate myself. I have a strong interest in, in transportation and the Regional Transportation Commission, and Councilmember Lynn seems so. Yeah, and I, I'm an alternate for Metro also, so there was no need in doing both. Uh -uh. That's okay, everybody? I go with that. Okay. Um, let's see. Santa Cruz Metro, and uh, Councilman Lynn is our representative there, and uh, they don't allow an alternate because I had no, no discussion with them. So. so what happens if you're not able to go? Um, and I know you always do go. But, yeah, we're actually sworn in, and, and um, so if there's there's quite a few of us, so if I didn't go, um, I wouldn't have a voice. So, okay. but uh, and there's and on top of being that, I'm also on their budget committee, which is strange for me because that was the one I least wanted to be on, but I'm learning a lot. So there's the two committees. We actually meet twice a month. So. Santa Margarita Groundwater Agency Joint Powers Authority. This is the super agency that the state's been dictating to us. And this has uh, City of Scotts Valley, City of Santa Cruz, San Andreas Valley Water District, Scotts Valley Water District, and there Santa is... Santa Cruz County and Santa Cruz City, too. Yes, and County oh. as well, yeah. And, and then the work by well owners and so forth. So anyway, um, uh, Councilman Wynn has been our representative there, and I've been the alternate. I've been going to all the meetings at Councilman Wynn's suggestion, and I've learned a lot about water and want to learn more. So um, I would like to take that primary role, and Councilman Wynn has agreed to uh, be my alternate, recognizing she doesn't have to do what I was doing in the learning phase <laughs> of being going to all as an alternate. So um, you're still fine with that? Everybody else is? Yeah, that, as I said, I'll, if there's when there's important things, I'll still be there. But, mm -hmm. Great. Yeah. And I'll keep you apprised, of course, because I know you have an interest. Right. So. Yes. Seniors Advisory Council. Um, I've been serving in that capacity, and I enjoy that, and we have lots of um, needs for our seniors. But if anyone else has an interest, let me know. Otherwise, I would continue that. The Monterey Bay Community Power Policy Board. Um, so this is made up of, uh, this is the, of course, the, uh, we're now getting our power through them. They're the, essentially the, the purchasing agency that's buying green power for the grid. And although we still pay our bills to PG&E, and PG&E still owns the, um, the lines, um, and PG&E has some issues right now. At any rate, um, I've been appointed by the City Selection Committee to, um, to this position, and, uh, but, you know, because they had to appoint somebody, so uh, let me know if anybody has concerns about that, 
But we also um, would need to appoint a, uh, an alternate, if anyone. Um, and so I would um, suggest perhaps uh, Councilmember Council Tim as the alternate, if, uh, if you're interested, still interested in that, and, or if anyone else is interested. Don't have too many yet. I think I, I still have one. Let's see. Just, just um, a reminder: it's a two-year rotation, so Capitol is rotating off or rotating on. And as the alternate, you would need to go to that because uh, necessarily, unless I was not able to, to make it. Um, then there's the Monterey Bay Community Power Operations Board, and the city manager has been uh, filling that role, and it is made up of city managers on the operations board. So the Operations Board, as with the Policy Board, um, establishes uh, bylaws that um, determine who is on the board. So the, the operating uh, bylaws say that the, all the city managers are on the operating policy as all elected officials. And I should have pointed out, both the Policy Board and the um, Operations Board were rotating on um, into those seats. Uh, Capitola previously had that, and they agreed to, uh, to not quite finish out their term and allow us to. So that'll be interesting. Visit Santa Cruz County Board of Directors, uh, dealing with tourism issues throughout the, the county, and that representative would represent Scotts Valley, Watsonville, and Capitol, all three cities. So we're rolling on this one. Um, and recently it's been, um, city manager has been on there. Charles Montoya from Watsonville was the representative on this before, the city manager. Um, we, I think we do have an option to be able to have been elected rather than, I, I believe Councilman Reed served on this committee in the past. Um, so anyway, the, the City Select Committee again did appoint our city manager as a representative, but I wanted to revisit that because there are options if, if the council wanted to go in a different direction. But I know council city manager is very, very interested in this. I think several of the other city managers are also serving. Yeah, the interest is purely because Maggie Ivey has um, shared with me that it, the questions that come up are less policy in nature, more operational, more fiscal related, and the prior city managers have told me the same thing, which is why Jamie Goldstein, who was in the seat previously, had recommended um, that a city manager fill that position. And, and that's completely consistent with my time on the board. It is. Yeah. I think, and, and, and I think outside of the one slot from the small cities, the only other, I think Santa Cruz has appointed representatives, elected representatives who have seats on that. But given the overwhelming importance of tourism in, in Santa Cruz, you can see why they would have some people there. So I think, I think Jenny's more than capable to do a great job. Okay. Next we have uh, standing local city council committees. Um, traffic Safety Committee. So this has been Councilmember Lynn and uh, former Councilmember Aguilar. Uh, they meet uh, as needed, which when something comes up. Um, and so, um, let's hear here. here um, I understand uh, why I would suggest Councilmember Lynn and perhaps Councilmember Tim. Um, it sounds like maybe Vice Mayor Johnson might be thinking about it. Oh, okay. You okay with it? That'd be great. Okay. Okay, there everybody else? I used to be on that long time ago. Okay. Why don't we things come up sometimes? Economic Development. <laughs> Economic Development Committee. Uh, we have uh, Vice Mayor Johnson and Councilman Reed on this, and it sounds like they both would like to continue. They have a strong interest in that. Affordable Housing Committee. That has been uh, former Councilmember Aguilar and uh, Councilmember Reed, and I'd like to in instead have myself and uh, Councilmember Tim on that. That's uh, perfect, Mayor. I was just going to say I uh, I appointed myself under the because I was mayor that year and we wanted to make some uh, some progress on things. So um, and Stephanie wanted to stay on it because that was such a passion of hers. So I'm completely fine with that. Okay, then we go. Move on, we're getting there to the last page. Um, we have now project specific city council subcommittees. These are ones of limited duration. Um, and, uh, and so we first have the town center subcommittee that hasn't been meeting. And at least in recent times, I know the council was expressing a desire to, on the current, where we are right now, 
council would meet as a, as a whole and talk about issues that come to us. Staff is doing, certainly inter interfacing with the, uh, uh, with the developer at this point and so forth. So this seems to me like one we don't need anymore. However, we could reconstitute it if we found that we had a, uh, a need for it. So everybody okay with that? Um, well, I, I don't, if, if there's any, if it's not meeting, then it just lies dormant, and so. So in order to um, qualify as an ad hoc committee, it has to be for a limited duration and for a specific purpose, and so if we um, allow it to continue and it be dormant, it's still existing and it's not really of a limited duration anymore, or it's a longer duration than is typically permitted for an ad hoc committee. So, so then, does, applying that logic, Kirsten, does that mean basically that every committee on here, on this list, these five, should we should only make appointments if they're, there's current work for them to do? Yes. Okay. Got it. I, I just got, our, our, in our Santa Margarita Water Committee, the attorney made a, a strong point, and it came up in a couple others, that um, being a lot uh, more rigid in that, um, that they beyond six months they're saying they should be eliminated or transferred over so that uh, in <clears throat> converted over to a commission so, or reestablished you know, when needed. Yeah she did a good job with that she boiled down a complicated subject into something that was fairly understandable. Okay um, next one is the Glenwood Open Space Subcommittee while well, we've the same logic, but we have different, I think some of these we do need to... Uh, some of these are meeting. Glen, uh, Glenwood Open Space, um, the purpose is done, I believe. We've, uh, we have our, our master plan and so forth. Um, so that would be, that would go away. Budget subcommittee, we talked tonight about the role of the budget subcommittee. So I believe that one should stay in place. And I think it should remain the mayor and the vice mayor. Okay, um, Sign subcommittee. I know we have slight issues in town, but I don't see us getting to anything in the in the near future, uh, given uh, staff staffing and, and so forth, uh, and the need for probably uh, uh, some some resources in that area. So I would we've suggest done quite a bit of work, but we've been at a stand, so we haven't met in probably a couple of years now. So. so I would suggest we take that away for now, but then we do bring it back um, at the appropriate time. Okay. And the last one on here is the Library Facilities Upgrade Subcommittee. And my understanding is they have been meeting about what to do with the, uh, the library uh, in Scotts Valley here and, and uh, how we best use the space and, and resources and so forth. And we have uh, Council Member Reed and Vice Mayor Johnson on that. I know they both have a lot of passion for the library and so I suggest we leave them on this if that works for everybody. And I believe I covered everything. There's nothing else that's not on this list that you know about? Well, how do we, I mean, given the, the legal instruction that we, that I, uh, Mayor and I got, how do we continue it beyond the six months? So what we are recommending is that for those two subcommittees, the Budget Subcommittee and the Library and Facilities Subcommittee, that we would come back to you with a resolution um, specifying exactly what tasks those subcommittees would perform and the duration of the committee. And then at the conclusion of that time, there would be a report from those committees. They would be disbanded and then we have constituted if we needed that. Didn't we already do that with the library subcommittee? Like the council took action uh, on the, the theater group and we and one of the one of the there's like a six point action plan that we the council took action to us to assign the work to the subcommittee. Yeah. This is a this is a new recommendation that when you form a subcommittee to codify it in in a resolution. And I've gotten clear direction from the council on the budget subcommittee based on our earlier conversation. And because of that staff report and direction, council, we also have clear direction on what the purpose is for the library upgrades. Did I overload anybody? Well done. We have closed session now, right? Yes, thank you. Um, let's see, and we probably have future agenda items. So. You, you do need to make a motion, Mayor, and have the council vote on that. Oh, yes, thank you. Um, so, um, can I have a motion to approve the uh, appointments that I was suggesting? So moved. Second. 
Second. Any other comments? No. All those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? No. Met. Motion passes, passes unanimously. And I think we probably want to look at this. The little blue tab. Thank you. Council agenda items. Um, council have anything? Did, did council member Reed mention something earlier? I'm trying to think of what it was. No? They're seeing none, uh, and no one in the public to suggest one. Uh, I will uh, convene to closed session. And the closed session subject is. The City Manager Performance Evaluation under Government Code Section 54957. Um, staff attending will be the City Manager and City Attorney. And we will reconvene, reconvene uh, and announce any action taken afterwards.